We'll go ahead and call our meeting to order. Uh, if you would, uh, join me in a flag salute. Well, thank you. Uh, Josh, would you do a roll call for us this morning? Good morning. Um, Rachel Arosmendi? Present. Ashley Bourne? Here. Don Bransford? Here. Don Cameron? Here. Nancy Cassidy? Here. Helene Dillard? Here. Mike Gallo? Here. Crystal Haling? Here. Eric Holst? Here. Jeff Huckabee? Here. Bryce Lumberg? Martha Montoya? Oh. Frank Mueller? <laughs> I keep on saying Mueller now. Mueller? <laughs> Joyce Sterling? <laughs> and Andrew? Here. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Jeff to our board. This is your first meeting, so welcome. Uh, I hope you gain a lot from uh, from what we uh, go through here. So, and Frank, you're uh, the other new board member. You were here at our last meeting. Welcome again. <laughs> you know, at this time, uh, we're going to move up the uh, the uh, secretary's report. Uh, Undersecretary uh, Moffat will be giving that this morning. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Undersecretary Moffat. Good morning, and yes, welcome new board members. It's glad to have a nice full board. It makes it, I guess, a little tight up here, but um, it's fantastic. And Crystal, too. All of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of new, a lot of um, new and new-ish faces, I guess we'll say, and people. So Secretary sends her regards this morning. She is currently actually at um, the Plaster Fairgrounds, which is going to now be named, and it's, it's going through a grand reveal this morning. Um, they did a $10 million upgrade, and they're now called The Grounds, and it's a partnership with um, Plaster Valley um, Tourism in the Plaster County. So the Fairgrounds is having their big grand reveal, and they'll now be called The Grounds. So she's down there, uh, or up there, I guess, in Roseville today. Um, speaking at their ceremony this morning, and she'll be here for the afternoon conversations. Uh, but she does send her regards. We at the department have been quite busy. Uh, budget process has been um, in its typical form. Um, we've been moving quite along on a lot of our budget proposals that we have. We have a few outstanding budget proposals that are still going through the dialogue and the discussion process through the legislature. One is our budget change proposal for the Asian citrus psyllid, um, and it's a $5 million proposal to enhance suppression activities and augment the quarantine regulations that we already have. Um, so that is one that continues to have dialogue. Um, and the other one is antimicrobial stewardship. This is uh, a budget proposal that we have for implementing SB 27. That was a 2015 bill from Jerry Hill. And, um, and so that one is in current dialogue as well as far as um, for antimicrobial stewardship. And the last one is our Be Safe program. We talked a lot about Be Safe at the, I believe it was the last meeting, two meetings ago. Two meetings, yeah. Time flies. Um, so that one continues to be um, a lot of, uh, have a continuous dialogue as well. Um, and so those are our three main budget items that are, are still going through the process. Um, Continuing on with legislation, we've been having a lot of active conversations. Rachel O'Brien, our new assistant secretary, has been um, doing a great job bringing and, and scheduling meetings with the secretary to meet one-on-one -on -one with a lot of members. Um, and so we're talking about a lot of things ag-related, but um, primarily one of our big issues is drinking water. For the things that are happening in the news, you might have heard about the romaine outbreak and uh, for food safety, we continue to roll out our Food Safety Modernization Act program. As the romaine outbreak has been going on, we've been in close coordination with both the FDA and the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement on this. This is um, an outbreak that has, to date, um, sickened 98 people with E. coli in 22 states, so pretty broad sweeping. Uh, from the information that the FDA has thus far, it's been contained to and, and strictly limited to um, production in Yuma, Arizona. They're working, um, while harvest is mostly wrapped up in Yuma, they're continuing to work on investigating so that they know the root cause so that um, it will be prevented in the future. 
Other news and much, much more exciting or positive news is our Division of Measurement Services um, along with CalRecycle um, made big news a couple weeks ago when we um, joined in a multi-agency team to stop recycling fraud. So this is just another example of the department partnering with other agencies and doing much more than our role in food and agriculture and really being part of, of solutions um, here in the state. So really great things coming out of, of DMS, Department of Measurement Services. Um, Secretary was busy last week. She was at the FFA annual meeting, the first time in Anaheim, and it was a very full crowd. In fact, they um, not only met and hit capacity at the event venue, um, they're going to look for broadening it out next year, but it was definitely um, a great event and, um, and a really positive opportunity for all those FFA students. Almost 7,000 FFA students attended. Big, big, big annual meeting. So also last week, and we're excited for the conversation today, um, Secretary joined the Farm Bureau um, down in, in Lodi for a Farmers for Free Trade event to talk about the importance of exporting for California products. So I'm looking forward to this conversation this morning on trade. And then finally in the afternoon, we're going to have Kaylee Ebright with the Resources Agency to talk about the Global Climate Action Summit. And we've been working at the department, as we all know, on climate smart agriculture for many years. Um, we're a partner in the Global Climate Action Summit. We're doing a pre-summit affiliated event. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you guys more one-on-one -on -one should you have questions about that event. The summit is going to be September 12th through the 14th. Um, our event will be September 11th and 12th. And then, um, and in addition, of course, we continue to roll out our climate change programs. We're currently accepting applications for the Alternative Manure Management Program. That's 19 to $33 million. That will go to basically anything but digesters on dairies and livestock operations here in the state. Uh, so things like drying out manure, converting it to compost, those sorts of uh, uh, pack beds, pack barns, those sorts of opportunities. So we're accepting applications until May 22nd. And we just wrapped up our Healthy Soils solicitation. Those deadline, that deadline was April 13th. And so we're reviewing those applications now. That's all I've got for the report. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, do you know the dollar amount that went to the Be Safe or that's allocated? For Be Safe, it's... Uh, um, I don't have it here. It's two staff positions. It's a pretty small dollar amount overall. I think it's more uh, the more of the conversation is is um, what is the appropriate funding source. The question that the legislature is asking is um, right now we're asking for general fund appropriation. Um, they're asking us if um, if this would be appropriate for an industry funded type of a, a program into the future. So that's the big question. I can't remember the exact dollar, but it's less than a million. It's pretty small. Thank you. Did you get the number of proposals you expected for the healthy soils? Can you share a little bit about what you have seen there? Yeah, um, I, we did get, um, I can't remember the full amount that we were requesting, but we did get meet and, and exceed the request of money. Um, so right now we're reviewing them. There is a minimum criteria that they all must meet. And so right now as we score those, look at the whether they met those that minimum criteria, we'll know for sure whether we met the full amount or not. Um, but we did get, as far as applications in the door, a lot of interest. We continue to get an exceptional amount of interest for the demonstration projects. Affordable, safe drinking water, as we remember last year, actually for the new board members, you won't remember, but we had Mr. Monning. Um, come and speak with us last fall about his bill, SB 623. It establishes a fund for affordable, safe drinking water. Part of that is um, would be fees from agriculture. There'd be a fertilizer fee, a dairy fee, and then also a livestock fee that we would be charged with collecting. Um, what we did this year was we, um, the, the Monning bill is still live and active. Um, but because we wanted to make sure as an administration that we could begin rolling out the program um, as soon as possible, we converted that and we adopted it as a budget trailer bill and we put a budget proposal in as well for that. So we have staff positions to start to gear up our fertilizer program to be able to take 
um, the additional mill that would be that is asked for in that legislation. Um, we are having conversations with stakeholders. Um, the original stakeholder group that was um, that was party with Mr. Monning and Mr. Monning, of course, is, is involved in the conversations as well on um, on amendments and, and adjustments to that to that bill as well, making sure that the language is um, is going to be exactly what we want when it does go through. As far as timing and timeline, uh, that is a good question. I don't have an answer for you. Um, we'd like to see it happen um, as soon as possible, whether that means it's gonna happen in the budget timeline. Um, I'm not sure yet, but that's our hope. But uh, another question on the Be Safe program. Um, there's obviously never enough money for uh, research with, uh, with the bees. But, um, you know, if there is an industry type uh, funding of the program, um, how are you going to do this? Uh, because there is a humongous number of bees that come in out of state on an annual basis. So um, certainly, uh, and and with that comes diseases and other 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 issues. So um, hopefully, um, that that'll all be considered. That is exactly the the question and the conversations that we're bringing up because of the amount of bees that are coming in from out of state. Traditionally, an industry-funded program, because our industry here is based here in California, we can do those sorts of things with out-of-state beekeepers. That's not necessarily, that, that adds a whole new layer of complexity. So those are the kinds of conversations that we are bringing up with members of the legislature um, as we talk about industry funding. Um, but yes, a lot of this Be Safe program is actually really looking at our border stations and finding solutions to really ensure that the bees that are coming through our border stations are clean, that they're not bringing in um, invasive ants and stuff like that. Um, and also um, and also being proactive and working with some sister states where a lot of the bees are coming from to really look at the at where they're coming from and, and, and find a solution there as well. Thank you, Jenny, appreciate yeah. the update. Um, if you've uh, taken a look at your agenda, you'll see that we're going to be discussing uh, trade, tariffs, and uh, climate change today. So we have a pretty full day of meetings. Um, you know, last week we had uh, Under Secretary McKinney in town, and I'd like to thank Frank for uh, hosting them in the afternoon. And I'm sure you discussed some points that, uh, you know, and our concerns uh, with trade in California because. You know, overall, 26% of uh, what we grow gets exported, and you know, certain crops it's as high as 70%. So, I think as growers, uh, California growers, we're all tuned in to to uh, what happens to our exports when tariffs are uh, or could be placed on them. So, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get some good good information today as we move through the different speakers. So, we'll start with uh, the presentation to the board. The uh, international trade and, and China. We have uh, Veronica Nye with the American Farm Bureau Federation via Skype. I think. Uh, minutes, huh? We'll apologize. Should we wait till after her presentation? Welcome, Veronica. Uh, Veronica is an economist with the American Farm Bureau Federation. In her position, Veronica co compiles and analyzes uh, data for a wide variety of economic and policy issues affecting U.S. agriculture, including international trade, environmental issues, and immigration. The American Farm Bureau is the largest general farm organization in the United States. So, Veronica, welcome to our meeting today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to join you. Um, let me uh, get my screen shared here. Um, there we go. Now, you, you all will promise not to tell my IT department how many windows I have open at all times, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just kind of get started here and say that, you know, the last several months have been has been pretty challenging for all of us. I, I know you all know that. Uh, California, uh, unfortunately, has 
uh, bore the brunt of uh, the, the tariffs that China has imposed thus far uh, on the 232 case. Um, we, like everyone else, are, are very concerned about what's already taken place and the potential for it to develop into a full-blown trade war over the next several months. Um, so it, it's been a little bit of a misadventures in, in trade of late. Um, but what we found helpful uh, in talking about this um, are, are just uh, sort of issues with China at the moment. Um, how we found it helpful with our members is to make sure and delineate that there are three separate cases uh, going on that are uh, all have the potential to, to impact our sector. Uh, the first uh, is the 201 case that we launched against solar panels and washing machines. And I'll get around to talking about that towards the end of my comments. Um, but most of our focus has been on the, the 232 uh, investigation on steel and aluminum and the uh, more recent 301 investigation on intellectual property infringement. Um, so I think the 232 case really was eye-opening uh, to all of us um, in that uh, it, it very much drove home that there are many folks in, in this administration uh, for whom steel and aluminum is, is the industry from which they came. Uh, it's the sector that they tend to focus the most on, um, steel and aluminum and, and uh, automobile manufacturing. So when, when the president announced that he was planning on um, potentially putting uh, tariffs of 25% on steel and 10% on aluminum to exporters from all nations, um, we all pretty quickly became uh, experts in steel and aluminum, right? Um, and, and took a look at who our actual trade partners were um, when it comes to these two products. Obviously, the target was, was China, um, and certainly they've had a pretty significant um, rise in their production and exports to the world of both these products. But when you look at who the United States is actually importing product from, only 3% of uh, steel coming into the United States is from China. Um, and what we what we saw and what we all saw is that Canada and Mexico um, and the EU are actually uh, who we're getting more of our product from. Uh, Canada is actually supplying about 18% of all the imported steel into the U.S. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is take a look, is we took a look at uh, what share of U.S. ag exports were going to top steel um, exporters, not necessarily producers, because uh, certainly, uh, we found that there was a, a division between who was producing the most and who was exporting the most to the U.S. Um, and we found the results pretty pretty startling. Um, that there are many, um, there are no, there are no states uh, among among our membership for whom um, our trade with uh, those countries um, that were on the um, uh, top steel exporters and stock top aluminum exporters uh, for whom uh, this wasn't going to be a big issue. Uh, in that top left corner, the share of US ag exports to top steel exporters, um, you'll see that uh, this is before the, the administration announced any exclusions. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, for the state of California, 67% of your exports were going to those countries, uh, the top 10 exporters of, of product um, uh, to, to the US. So. Um, that became a, a pretty big deal pretty quickly. Similarly, on aluminum, 53% uh, of your state's exports uh, were destined to those countries that we were uh, importing a lot of aluminum from. And um, that's that's because you know when we go down the list of our top export destinations for ag products, it's uh, I, I don't have to tell you all you're the the biggest exporter in, in the United States, but uh, we're talking about Canada, uh, China number two, Mexico three. Um, South Korea, uh, the EU, um, those those make up about 65%, uh, those top five markets of all of our ag exports. So uh, we uh, pretty quickly uh, gave this these slides to our board um, and they sent a letter directly to Secretary Purdue to say, uh, listen, this is a pretty big deal and um, we can't possibly be uh, thinking about putting all of um, making these tariffs apply to all uh, all countries. 
Um, so on the 22nd of March, uh, the White House announced that Canada, Mexico, South Korea, the EU, Australia, Argentina, and Brazil uh, had earned exceptions uh, to the application of uh, the aluminum and steel tariffs. Uh, last night, um, that ex those exceptions were, were about to expire, um, and the White House announced that, uh, in fact, they were going to delay that um, application of tariffs to those countries for another 30 days. Um, Canada and Mexico uh, conclusion of NAFTA has certainly been uh, made a, a critical element of this aluminum steel discussion. Um, so that's very much their exclusion is hinged on a successful NAFTA 2.0. Uh, South Korea is the only country on this list that managed to have uh, a permanent exclusion. Um, they promised as a re through a revised chorus agreement that they would um, develop an export quota uh, for aluminum and, uh, or for steel in particular uh, that was 70 percent of their last five-year average of, of exports. Um, Australia, Argentina, and Brazil, the White House in their announcement yesterday said that they had developed something similar and they would expect to finalize that agreement uh, in the next over the next 30 days. Uh, the EU is probably the only one on that list that really is still in, in significant limbo uh, with, with no free trade agreement tied to uh, permanent exclusion. Um, and they've been very resistant up until this point uh, of agreeing to any sort of uh, an export quota. Now, um, back, I'm sorry, back to, the, to that map, you'll still see <laughs> that even with those countries excluded, we're still talking about a lot of ag products. Um, for your state, 45 to 47 percent of your ag exports are two countries that were not excluded, uh, China uh, chief among them. So when March 23rd rolled around and those tariffs went into effect, uh, China responded uh, pretty immediately and said, you know, guys, this 232, uh, it doesn't really seem to us as if it was indeed um, a national security issue, which is what the administration, um, uh, that 232 investigation suggested. And in fact, this is a, this is a remedy that, uh, to anti-dumping and countervailing duties that should have gone through the WTO. Uh, and since, since you didn't follow the rules and you're suspending our rights, we are going to suspend yours. And so they put out that list of 128 products. Um, 34 of them were steel and aluminum. Everything else was agricultural. Uh, pork received a 25% uh, tariff. Um, the other 86 products received that 15% tariff, um, including um, uh, many products from, from your state. Um, obviously, uh, chief among them, uh, the tree nuts with um, uh, walnuts, almonds, uh, and pistachios uh, high up there. Um, the inclusion of apples has also been uh, a very much a concern, uh, both for, for your state and for um, the, the larger Pacific Northwest uh, region. Um, ginseng, wine, and, and ethanol uh, also sort of rounding out that list. Um, we have yet to see um, there, there's sort of interesting reports out of China as to whether or not the tariffs are being applied and how they are, or if they're being applied equally among ports of entry and on products. So we've heard somewhat recently that on the pork side, um, the Chinese government is very reticent to actually apply uh, those tariffs and, and cause the price of pork to, to go up because they know that it would directly impact consumer prices of pork. Uh, so there, there have been uh, sort of whisperings uh, that indeed when, uh, when pork is coming into to China, the additional 25% tariff is being paid, uh, but that uh, the Chinese government has, uh, there's a, a little bit of a whisper, whisper, nudge, nudge, that uh, that tariff will be made up to, um, to the industry in other parts of, uh, of the sector. So uh, maybe you'll receive your, uh, your corn at a, at a lower price or um, other, other inputs could potentially be, could be lower to try to offset that, 
that impact to try to keep that additional tariff from being applied at the consumer level. Um, it's it's been a little too early uh, to see it this reflected significantly in the in the trade data. Uh, I'd be curious to hear from you all if if your exporters are um, are ha feeling the impact of this uh, yet. Um, certainly, we've heard from from some Apple folks that. Um, it hadn't, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, it hadn't changed uh, purchasing quite yet, but there was significant concern. Now, the other sort of side of this is that the EU also, uh, even though they're on that ex the exclusion list right now, um, are quite unhappy <laughs> and have uh, released a 10-page document of HS10 level tariff lines uh, that they would retaliate against the U.S., um, in the case that they were to find themselves uh, subject to those aluminum and steel tariffs. Um, that product list includes kidney beans, uh, rice, corn, cranberries, peanut butter, sweet corn, orange juice, tobacco, whiskey, cigars, and cigarettes. While that's very much a political list, um, there are some, some products uh, that um, there's some real trade value there. Uh, for you, of course, the, the one that would stand out the most would be uh, rice. Um, in total, uh, I took a look of the products on that list. Last year, California exported about $36 million in product uh, to the EU. Uh, about $26 million of that was, was in that rice category. Um, so the maybe the, the more significant, um, be, just because of the dollar value that uh, the U.S. is talking about is the potential impact of a, a 301 response. Um, so we, like most of, of the industry, are certainly uh, compiling uh, comments and, and submitting those to uh, the U.S. Trade Representative um, as they're having their hearing um, in the next couple of weeks on the potential impact if uh, to different sectors if these uh, were to come into effect. Um, but that Potential 301 response includes um, some uh, some big boys, <laughs> if you will, in our total trade relationship with uh, with China. Um, chief among them being soybeans. Uh, the Chinese market has become especially critical for U.S. soybean producers. Um, we exported um, about 12 and a half billion dollars in beans to China last year, which was about 60 percent of total uh, soybean exports. Um, uh, beef, the U.S. has been working for, for a very long time to try to reopen that market, and only just recently uh, were able to open it up. Um, uh, corn is, is one of those, and DDGs are, are those products that were in and out of the market. Uh, cotton is a big deal. Um, so there's a, a some really significant products that could potentially uh, face retaliation here. Um, and when, even when the the list was announced that 25% additional ad valorem uh, tariff would be applied. Um, we saw a pretty strong market, immediate market reaction. Bean prices fell um, four to five percent uh, that same day, uh, which is approximately what we think prices would do in the long term if that, um, if uh, this retaliation list came into effect. Uh, similarly, uh, on corn, uh, we lost. Uh, about 4% on prices the day the list was uh, revealed, um, which long term we think the, the impact would only be 2 to 2.5%. Two but, you know, if you're uh, harvesting 1,000 acres of corn, that still amounts to somewhere between eleven dollars and $15,000 in lost income for nothing. Um, and, and I put this, this figure of U.S. sorghum exports to China up here uh, because it, it really draws home uh, what impact these, these tariffs can have. Um, now, the, China launched a, an anti-dumping and countervailing duty investigation on U.S. sorghum exports um, back in February. Uh, there was some speculation that it was in response to that uh, washing machine, machine and solar panel case that the U.S. had initiated. Uh, the Chinese say that, no, in fact, it was on its own merits. Uh, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. Um, but China made the announcement on the 4th of February that they were just planning on uh, starting the investigation, which is denoted with that yellow line. Uh, the, the gray line is the um, new sales that have uh, of U.S. sorghum since that announcement was made. And you'll see that uh, they've 
basically leveled off to zero. Um, that was the the importers acknowledging the fact that if um, if this were to happen, uh, the U.S. sorghum would would no longer be competitive. Um, and in fact, when when China did uh, announce on uh, the 17th of of April that they had found uh, dumping by by U.S. sorghum, that uh, boats started turning around. Now that's 179 percent uh, tariff. That was obviously intended to completely stop product, but um, it's it's difficult to imagine a lot of, of products for whom the U.S. is 25 percent um, more price competitive than than uh, our competition. So uh, I think we're looking at U.S. sorghum as uh, maybe a harbinger of of what could happen to other uh, products if, in fact, that 301 response were to were to come into effect. Um, so certainly uh, a lot to uh, to lose sleep over, <laughs> and I, uh, I I'm usually just the deliverer of good news here uh, at American Farm Bureau, and I'm sorry to, to do that to you all as well. Though I know you're well aware of, of the situation, um, that's why uh, U.S. Uh, our American Farm Bureau and, and other folks have have been across the ag and non-ag community have. Um, all been participating in a wide variety of different coalitions to try to drive home the point, both to the in the media and to the administration, that this is a big deal. Uh, I know that just last week, Farmers for Free Trade um, had an event in Sacramento and talked about uh, all of the the impact to to your state that the uh, 232 tariffs that China had imposed were were having. Um, that was. Uh, um, California Farm Bureau, I know, with the president, has been very uh, active in telling that the negative tale that is that is being sown out there. So um, that's certainly uh, we're pushing to try to educate the administration and the uh, the media and the ag community at large how devastating this could be to our sector. Uh, but it's going to take all of us to try to keep us uh, from going over this cliff. I'm afraid. And that pretty much wraps up my comments. Um, happy to to answer um, any any questions that folks may have. Thank you, Veronica. Um, yeah, I'd like to open it with a question. Uh, last week we had uh, Undersecretary uh, McKinney, uh, and he had referenced the President's directive to uh, Secretary Purdue in developing options that will assist farmers that are affected negatively by these trade developments. Um, do you have any idea what, what this would look like? And, and especially because of in California, I mean, I can, I can see that being a possibility where you've got, you know, cotton, soy, corn program crops that have always had delivery mechanisms. But California, you know, we've got specialty crops that really haven't been involved in um, some of the, the programs uh, associated with the Farm Bill other than specialty grants. So how do you see that affecting California? You know, I think we've all been pretty resolute in that we want to derive our uh, our income from the market, and not from a, a government program. Um, I think we have pretty significant concerns that um, the, the level of income disruption and loss that we're talking about here um, I'm not sure where USDA is going to find that kind of money. Um, there have been talks that perhaps that money could come out of uh, the CCC, um, but and the, and the secretary has that discretion. Um, but the level of, of impact that we're talking about, uh, I think you probably only get away with that for one year. Um, so what happens in the second year? And as you pointed out, how do you divvy that up? Um, as as the resident nerd around here. It's really difficult to isolate different impacts. Um, you know, when we're talking about even even the pork situation, um, it was it was pretty clear to to us that China was going to import less pork this year. Uh, they have a lot of domestic production, uh, and they had increased their their slaughter capacity. So, um, pork producers are a lot like specialty crop folks in that they haven't participated in in farm bill and those type of programs, uh, and. So how do you how do you deliver that that sort of um, uh, assistance? How long could it last? Um, and how do you identify the the different impacts that uh, that are out there? Um, 
and do it in a timely way so that folks don't go out of business in, in the process. Um, we're, we're very concerned that there is not a good outcome in, in that situation. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open this up to the board. Veronica, Don. Uh, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, if there was a mechanism, would it even be WTO compliant or, or do you then have a WTO complaint that, that immediately gets filed? Because uh, it's, you know, this is a, this is caused by a trade war. It's not a, it's not market driven. No, I think you're, you're certainly uh, correct to be concerned about that. Um, China has already uh, filed WTO, uh, WTO case against the U.S. on the 232. Uh, the EU has joined in on that, even though they're currently excluded uh, because they're so concerned about the potential impact. Uh, so I think the the WTO response would be would be very um, would be very rapid. Unfortunately, with the WTO um, and 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 why it is a bit fallen out of favor with this current administration is the process is slow. So uh, my concern would be that, one, yes, it's, it would clearly be WTO uh, non-compliant, but that it would take several years for the WTO process to play out. And in the meantime, we could certainly wreck our markets uh, for, for several years and well into the future. I'm wondering if the worst case scenario, what is the approximate dollar value we're talking about affecting the California market? Yeah, so, um, you know, we exported uh, almost $20 billion in, in ag products to China last year. Uh, I think the Chinese <laughs> have done a very nice job of finding other suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to remember that for most products, there are there are competitors that are just as able to provide that product as we are. Um, they've built up reserves of many of these products. Um, so I, I think they could probably go without um, U.S. ag exports for quite a while. Um, on the soybean side, there's a little bit more play there uh, because Argentina and Brazil uh, certainly are significant uh, producers. Uh, but I, I hesitate a bit to give you a, a, a a number. We've we've been a, a little reticent to do that in any realm, um, but ten to ten to twenty billion dollars is is not out of the realm of possibility here. And and for many of, of um, many products, the the Chinese market is is much more significant than others, right? So um, we talk about soybeans because it's a big deal to the the larger trade relationship. Um, and 60% of our, our bean exports are going there. But for many of your products and, and many of your exporters, I'm sure that their, uh, China's mark, the share of, of your product that's going to China is, is well north of that 60%. So for those folks, um, pretty, pretty devastating. And I think in this, um, in this discussion, we have to both talk about the big numbers, but also talk about the number of, of producers and how able, a producer who's completely reliant on the Chinese market, how able they would be to find a, a new market um, fairly quickly, because uh, this is an off and on. Uh, clearly, the Chinese have, have showed us that they can turn the market off and on. Actually, you may have answered this, but I just wanted a point of clarification. Was it 20 billion export from United States and California's north of 60 percent of that 20 billion? Uh, about 20 billion from the U.S. Um, and the 60 percent was in reference to the share of all soybean exports uh, from the U.S. that are going to uh, to China. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I just had a question. I I heard some frustration out of Washington D.C. that that they're not very happy with Ag's reaction to this. But um, my observation is we're very splintered agriculture, coming from a lot of different commodity groups. Everyone has different interests. Are we doing enough to unify the ag community together to, to get that message to Washington, D.C.? That's a good question. Um, and certainly there has there's splintering uh, throughout agriculture on a pretty wide variety of issues um, based on commodity and geography. But I will say that on, on the trade issue, uh, folks have been, have been marching to the same beat. Um, 
we we haven't seen a lot of, of splintering there. Everyone uh, seems to be on the same page. Um, we meet um, really just a, a, an incredible number of times <laughs> per week uh, with through conference calls and in person um, and, and meetings to the hill, letters to the hill. Um, that they're all they're all on the same page that this is a big deal and we need to avoid um, an all out trade war. So. Um, Certainly, there's always more that can be done, uh, but I, I know that for us as a single organization, we're members of seven different um, organizations here and in, in coalitions here in town to try to drive home the importance of agricultural trade, um, again, within the ag community and the non-ag community at large. Do we have any other questions? Well, Veronica, we really appreciate you giving us the overview from the uh, Farm Bureau's perspective and really the national look. Uh, we're going to drill down a little further with our next presentation, but uh, for the California viewpoint, but really appreciate your time today and thank you again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I was neglectful in uh, getting the minutes approved. So uh, we need a motion to approve the April 3rd meetings. No uh, minutes. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? So moved. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, presentation. As I said, we're going to be uh, talking about California agricultural exports and China. Um, we have uh, Dan Sumner from the University of California. Dan is a uh, Frank H. Buck. Uh, Junior Distinguished Professor in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at the University of California, Davis, and the Director for the University of California Ag Issues Center. Quite simply, Dan is one of the foremost agricultural economic economists in the state and a great friend to California agriculture. So Dan, we'll uh, let you go ahead, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm mostly gonna be just showing you data uh, but I want to say a couple of things uh, first. A AIC uh, that I'm involved in, as well as our program at the uh, Agriculture and Resource Economics Department at Davis, do a whole variety of things related to California agriculture, everything from greenhouse gases to uh, dairy markets to, to honeybees. And when I heard the conversation about uh, bee health a few minutes ago, uh, we're in the midst now. We have a project with the uh, American Honey Board, for example, and we're doing some cost studies on we do lots of cost studies on agricultural commodities. We've never actually done cost studies on beekeeping as an industry. We're working with the bee industry now to do that kind of study. So we do a whole variety of things, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've been uh, uh, talking to a lot of people about trade in China and NAFTA and, and you name it over the last uh, uh, weeks and months and, well, more than a year. Uh, more than usual. Uh, what I draw on for that is data that's been sponsored by the California Department of Food and Ag going back more than 20 years, back when Ann Veneman, some of you are old enough to remember Ann, when Ann was secretary here, not in Washington. Uh, and and uh, in fact, I was communicating with her the other day and I told her this program of California agricultural exports that we do at the Agricultural Issues Center, sponsored by the department, has been going on uh, ever since she was secretary. She was very proud to hear that. And I'm very proud that uh, Secretary Ross has been a strong supporter of that effort as well. And much of the data that I'm gonna show you relates to that. Uh, sometimes in California, we forget we're not a separate country. Uh, we don't have any trade statistics for California. It's actually impossible to get trade statistics, hard numbers for California, because th those records aren't kept. Uh, you know, it's, it's US exports and it, the port data and all that. Now, it's easy for almonds because there aren't any other almonds in California or pistachios. When it comes to something like dairy products, it's incredibly hard because, of course, we also don't keep track of California shipments of dairy products, that is, as a state, uh, that go to Ohio, for example. And we don't know how much is consumed here. We can make estimates. So I have uh, a couple of people that help me, and we make those estimates. The numbers aren't perfect, and you'll see some places where I think they're not perfect, but we're always trying to uh, improve them. Uh, last, I guess it was Wednesday or Thursday night, uh, I was in LA at a public event putting on, put on by a group called Zocalo, which does, does big public affairs events. 
This was in the middle of downtown LA. Uh, and I was really thrilled that they thought that agriculture, uh, on trade in China, and they had some hedge fund guys and some folks like that, and one uh, UCLA uh, econometrician, and they thought agriculture was important enough they wanted somebody to talk about agriculture there, which, which made me very happy, and it should make you very happy that people in the middle of L.A. still know that California agriculture is important, and it's not everybody that knows that, and it's one of our jobs to sort of keep them thinking about that. Certainly, California relies on exports, uh, and China is an important market. Not for every commodity, but it, in general, it's an important market. And one of the points I like to make, economists always say, gee, trade's a two-way street. That's not really the quite road analogy. And you know that when you look at what happens with China. As, as uh, Veronica just said, gee, they can source things from other places. We can ship things to other places. Uh, uh, rather than a, two, a single two-way street, trade's like a Google map. You know, it's got every road around. And when you think about trade relationships, stuff from California goes out to 100, 200 destinations around the world, depending on whether you think of the EU, EU as one place or many places. And sometimes we don't really know. And I'll get into that in a second. So something goes into the Port of Rotterdam, it's registered as an import to some place in Europe, and who knows where it goes once it gets there. Similar to things that come into the Port of Oakland and find their way to Ohio. Uh, you, you know, when somebody ships something to the United States, they don't know which state it's going to be consumed in. That is, the individual companies might, but even there, they often don't. Um, so this, it, this also means that bilateral trade deficits really mean nothing when it comes to the economic relationships. And that's a problem because we hear lots of rhetoric out of the administration paying attention to, gee, we have a trade surplus with Mexico, or we know we have a trade deficit with Mexico and a surplus with somebody else. Uh, Canada's uh, government came out recently and said, oh, if you measure it more carefully, we actually have a trade surplus with Canada. Somehow that means they're okay. Well, uh, that's not true when it comes to certain dairy product policies in, China, in Canada, of course. So I, I hope you won't be get wrapped up in this bilateral deficit rhetoric. It's really a meaningless concept, given that there are lots of roads out there when it comes to trade. Uh, when I said it's difficult to get, uh, and, and it's, the, there's a problem with export data, Hong Kong is a particular issue, particularly talking about China. And the reason is, and you'll see in a second, in our data, the, the stuff I put together uh, for where we ship California agriculture, for the last 20 or 25 years, we put Hong Kong and China together. And the reason is so much went, stuff that went into Hong Kong made its way to China. I remember years ago when Roger Wasson was telling me about almonds, and, and he said, oh, yeah, we ship it to, 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 to Hong Kong, but, it, it, but they were doing promotion programs in, Guang, in Guangzhou. And I said, well, but it's banned to ship almonds to China. What are you doing? He said, well, we want the chefs to know how to use almonds because they get there. And, you know, I, I didn't ask any more questions <laughs> about that. So that's, that's, less so that's less true now. It's more official now, but it is something to pay attention to. And finally, the last thing I want to, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of data, but rhetoric matters. And we just heard Veronica talk about certain tariffs that have already been applied and tariffs that haven't been applied. And this applies to China, but it also applies to Mexico and China. If you'll remember, those of you that pay attention to these uh, trade news, Back a year ago, uh, people in Mexico, buyers, in, not just the government, but buyers in Mexico said, oh, we're looking to source dairy, more dairy products from New Zealand and more corn from Brazil and Argentina because the U.S. government is talking about blocking trade. And just that conversation is enough to make people react. And what I say there is that any time you make a market less secure, you make your buyer start worrying about whether you're going to be a reliable supplier, uh, they start looking around. And I know there are people, Mexico is a big market for California dairy products. They love dealing with California businesses. They're good businesses. They have 20-year relationships. And still somebody says, yeah, we really like ours. The company we deal with in California, we really like dealing with them. But either our government or their government may get in the way. Let's talk to Fonterra about something. And that's not what you want uh, your customers doing. And, and so uh, my point here is that rhetoric matters, and that's disappointing. Uh, uh, and, and it's something that businesses have to deal with. 
uh, every day. So that also makes it hard to know what was caused by an increase of tariffs if they've already, before the tariffs are ever applied, they've reduced their imports of California stuff. So let's talk about data. This is a slide that I, many of you have memorized. Uh, it's, it's 2016 data. That's the last year for which we have the full estimates done. Almonds are, uh, have grown and grown and grown. We know that. Dairy products are the number two California agricultural export by value, which is impressive uh, given the history of our dairy industry. We used to not be able to be a commercial dairy exporter, not just California, but the U.S. as a whole. Uh, immense growth in the productivity and compet global competitiveness of the U.S. dairy industry led by California. Then the other tree nuts and wine. This is worldwide. This isn't just a China. Uh, pistachios happen to have a big year in 2016, small year, you know, pistachios do this. Uh, so, so this isn't the long-term truth. Pistachio is not that high on the list usually. But you go around to, to table grapes and tomatoes and rice and, and uh, oranges and other products, the sort of folks that are going to be on the panel after me are well represented on this list. As you, uh, wh Whoever put together this list knew that, right? Or put together the panel uh, knew that. Uh, let's talk about the top ten destinations for all products. And the European Union and, and Canada go back and forth a little bit there. Canada, for most California agricultural exports, Canada is just another state. You know, whether something goes to Toronto or Cleveland, who knows or cares? Uh, so if it's lettuce or fresh produce, the sort of fresh stuff that we send to the rest of the United States that everybody in the U.S. Is, wants to get from us goes to Canada as well. And that's, you know, whether it's strawberries or, or, or produce, uh, Canada's that kind of market. The European Union is a lot of tr tree nuts and a lot of wine, but a fairly broad array of things as well. China and Hong Kong are third. They're put together there for the reasons I talked about earlier because we had the sense when we started doing this list it was very hard to separate the two. It's still hard to separate the two, but I'm going to show you some things where I have separated them. Uh, when I started this 20 years ago, Japan was number one, and that tells you a little bit about how trade has changed, uh, and our commodities have changed a bit, and Mexico wasn't on the list then, and Mexico has grown very rapidly. As a, as a destination, as has India, by the way, because of very rapid economic growth and a little bit of liberalization. India would be much bigger if they would open up more, uh, and they will. It's, it's, it's coming, but it just hadn't happened yet. So now let's talk about China, and I'm going to do China and Hong Kong separately, and the press and even some folks in agriculture mix those together. Partly, it's partly my fault because we put them together in our California data. So this is U.S., it's not just California. But these are commodities that are important in California. So if you look, went down that commodity list, these are high-level uh, high commodities uh, that, that also get sent to China or Hong Kong. So I haven't put things like lettuce and celery and broccoli on here because very little of that gets, gets over to Asia. A little bit to Hong Kong, but, but not very much of it to Asia. That's mostly a, 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 a Canada-Mexico deal. Dairy is number one there. This is value. Uh, uh, so, so you won't find soybeans on here for good reason. Uh, they're, they're not big here. Uh, and Don, I'm, I, I apologize for not having rice on this list. I should have said to the guy, hey, wait, Don's going to be there. He's going to yell at me. So, Yeah. Next year. Next year. Uh, and we're, we're doing 2017 right now. Uh, alfalfa hay hasn't been on the retaliation list yet, but that's a big export. Uh, and much of that is California, about half of it probably. It's a western states export. And, and there, that's something we want to keep straight a little bit. Uh, what I tell the people, I, I talk to the hay guys all the time, and what I say to them is you can ship hay to China or you can ship hay to Tulare County and they'll ship dairy products to China. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's, it's, Cal it's California hay. It's western hay going to China either in the form of dry milk powder or in the form of hay. <laughs> and that's something you have to realize about trade. These products can mix, and whether you ship it directly or you ship it uh, through another product uh, isn't all that important. And it's really not even all that important if it's Nevada hay uh, that goes to China and then California hay goes to Tulare County or Nevada hay goes to Tulare County. And, you know, the, that when I say many roads here, you, you really want to think about it, and it also goes across products. Almonds, notice almonds don't go to China nearly as much as they go to Hong Kong. 
Uh, they may end up in China, but they go originally to Hong Kong. And they can be repack so they can legally go to Hong Kong and be called a Hong Kong product if there's substantial transformation. If, if they just go into Hong Kong, somebody un unloads the boat, puts it on a train, and it goes into China, then it's a product of the United States, and it will be in these data, if it's all done legally, it'll be in these data as a shipment directly to China uh, because it's just transformed in. Uh, and we do have data on Hong Kong shipments to China, and we've done a lot of work on that in wine recently, Julian Alston and I, uh, for some publications. Uh, so you want to be a little careful with these numbers. We don't know how much. This isn't where they end up. This is where they go in. Uh, but if it's an almond that is sent bulk to Hong Kong and substantially transformed, say repackaged, roasted, salted, maybe with a little flavoring, goes into China, then it can be called a product from Hong Kong if if legally labeled if there's substantial transformation of the product. And there's all kinds of technical rules that some lawyer will tell you about that I can't. Uh, wine is an interesting case, and it's the only one that's relatively balanced. But I will tell you that California Wine, and the Wine Institute knows this, has a lot, to work, a lot of work to do in both the Chinese market and the Hong Kong market. Uh, the announcement that was just coming out is that Australian and I think even New Zealand wine Chilean wine are doing very well in those markets relative to California wine. And, and that's a challenge for us. Now, if, if we can sell our wine at high prices other places, who needs the Chinese market? If, if they want to be buying the cheapest possible Chilean wine and it's a, a price point below where our, our industry can meet it, okay. But what we don't want to do is find ourselves not being able to get into a market. And I would say for wine, and you'll hear from the wine industry in a few minutes, but it's the longer-term future that's crucial there. What you don't want to do is disrupt. You don't want some guy who's got California wine in a wine list at a hotel to say, uh, well, we'll just take those off the wine list because, after all, who knows whether we're going to have access to it. That's this long-term future. That's where, again, rhetoric matters. Uh, pistachios uh, don't go to China. That number for Hong Kong is wrong. I just noticed that. Uh, uh, it, it should be more like 700,000. And in fact, what's wrong there is the, on that slide where it says walnuts, that's pistachios, and when it says pistachios, that's walnuts. We ship almost no walnuts to China or Hong Kong. They're, they're a big producer of walnuts there. They don't produce any pistachios. So why didn't you catch that? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry for that. So the 619, scratch that off your list. That should be pistachios, not walnuts. The beef exports are a very interesting case for us because uh, that beef is mostly not California, though we do ship a significant amount of beef out of California that's produced in California. It's one that it's hard to measure because most of the beef that goes out of the West Coast ports comes from the Midwest, not from California. But we are a significant exporter of beef, even though we're a net importer of beef in California. We eat more beef than we produce here. Uh, beef's complicated. I won't get into it. Uh, we produce more beef than we slaughter in California, sort of the fat cattle. We produce a lot of feeder cattle that goes to the Midwest, fed in Nebraska, comes back to California. So it's partly California beef in a lot of cases. Um, let's, let's look at some individual commodities. So uh, China is important for, uh, for uh, almonds, 100 million bucks, excuse me, 100,000 bucks or so, but that, that's out of $3 million worth of trade, or $3 billion worth of trade. So it's $100 million out of, out of several billion. So it, for any other commodity, that'd be a big number. For almonds, it's not as big a number. And you see the EU and India and, and, and around. Hong Kong, there's lots of shipments into China. This is uh, uh, 2017 numbers. They're, these are U.S. official statistics, but they apply to California. Uh, these are the pistachio numbers, and, and here's the Hong Kong that I was telling you about. Uh, we ship very little to China directly, lots to Hong Kong. Much of that, we believe, goes into China. That's too many pistachios for the people of Hong Kong to consume. We know it's not being consumed there. We think much of it goes into China. Uh, the people in the pistachio industry may, may have a better handle on that. Uh, this year, Josh, we are going to separate Hong Kong and China in the 2017 reports you get from us. 
And we may try to do that a little bit retrospectively. It, it'll, it'll be hard because of this China-Hong Kong thing, but, but we're working on it. Uh, for U.S. wine, Hong Kong is the number uh, three destination between the, behind the EU and Canada. Uh, again, that's not a lot of wine. $100 million worth of wine to Hong Kong is not that much wine. Uh, they could be consuming that internally, but we also think a good bit of that uh, uh, finally gets into China. China's about a $75 uh, million dollar market. Uh, that's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money relative to the size of California wine imports. So as a share, you can see there's the European Union at $400 million and there's China at $75 million. Uh, we, we've done some papers uh, uh, with colleagues looking directly at the Chinese market for California wine. Uh, we had some st Chinese students interviewing uh, uh, stores in China, asking them about where they position California wine on the shelf. This is before we could get uh, consumer data in China, and we had people out there with measuring, uh, they, they had tape measures, measuring how many meters on the shelf were California wine and how many meters were European and other things. And the modal question we had from people in China that were the wine category managers at supermarkets was, oh, you mean they produce wine in California? We didn't know that. So there's, there's work to do there. Now, we've made progress over the last decade, but it's still the case that most of the imports of wine into China do not come from California. It's, it's Europe, uh, and, and you know France still has that reputation. And then on the price side, it's Australia and New Zealand that can beat us on price. And, New Z uh, excuse me, and, and Chile. And Chile has a free trade agreement, which helps them. The, the, the final bunch of data I want to show you um, have to do with dairy products in detail. And notice most of them go directly into China, and it depends on what you send. And, and these are products that are hard, uh, that, that are important products for California. Dry milk powder, uh, it's not fancy cheeses. It's, it's dry milk powder and whey products, which is, of course, a byproduct from the cheese. And then lactose and casein, which are also uh, byproducts that we ship. These are values, so there would be lots of tonnage of lactose, which is a cheap product, and much less in terms of the high-protein whey products that we're shipping there. Uh, so here's a case where we're going directly to China, and if uh, they end up putting dairy products on a list, that'll hurt our industry directly. One of the things that I think China is going to do more of is, is choose to import things like dairy products, as they're already doing with beef, they're going to do more of with pork, just because animal agriculture is hard to do in a place where you've got so many people. Now, we have some of those problems here in California where we have manure handling and we were talking about greenhouse gases and other things. So animal agriculture has challenges even in California, uh, in China even more so, and it's cheaper to ship dairy products out of the port of Oakland into ports in China than it is by train from far, what would that be, western China uh, into where the population centers are along the coast. So we have a comparative advantage when it comes to transport costs relative to within China. And sometimes it's easy to forget that, but ocean transport, particularly if it's a backhaul like we do with, to China, is really cheap relative to, to ground transportation. So those are a bunch of numbers. The last thing I wanted to say, I wanted to make a point about the WTO. Uh, and we had an opportunity to host uh, uh, Under Secretary McKinney there at Davis, and I thank Helene for or, uh, Dean Dillard for uh, for hosting that. And he did a great job of talking to our students. Uh, he addressed his remarks. There were a bunch of faculty members there like me, but he addressed the remarks appropriately to the students. And he was talking to them about how to get jobs, how to be open to the world, uh, how to think about things globally, all of that. And I thought uh, he did a did a great job. When in response to, to these trade issues, he went down these trade issues and, uh, as he did with some of you, and uh, uh, he, he talked a little about using the WTO, and he uh, expressed great support for the WTO, but also the same frustration we heard from the Farm Bureau uh, person, Veronica, about how long things take there. And I, uh, one, one point I, I want to make about that is, um, in my experience, the WTO is lightning fast compared to the U.S. court system. <laughs> that, that is to say, 
It's a litigation. You got a bunch of lawyers, uh, which means you appeal and you write briefs and all this stuff that lawyers do. And any of you that have ever seen, you know, think of water litigation in, in California. Gee, how old is Dan Dooley now? And he started doing that when he was 11 <laughs> years old, you know? Uh, so so uh, I know how, Dan, how old Dan is because we were in high school together. Uh, so I know precisely how old he is. But, but the point is, uh, these things have been good, you know, uh, litigation takes a while. And the WTO actually puts much shorter horizons on things than most litigation does, given that important cases are always appealed. And the, in the U.S., when we're bringing a case against somebody else, as we are now doing with China, uh, we complain when they lose and then they appeal. But, of course, when somebody brings a case against <laughs> us, as they've done for Airbus and, and Boeing, for example, uh, that case has been going on for about 20 years or almost, various phases of it. And when, when the U.S. wins a piece of it, the European Union appeals. When, we win a piece, when they win a piece of it, the U.S. appeals. Now, everybody believes that you ought to have your appeal rights if you've lost, and, and you wish the other guy didn't when you win. But, but it's, it's, it's like normal litigation. And, and so that, that's one that I do think we'd want to be careful about. And China has complained already that the U.S. has violated uh, what they see as their rights. And if the U.S. were to win that case, I would be shocked if we didn't appeal that, even if it's the next administration whoever that would be, even if, even if it's not President Trump in the next administration, I'd be surprised that the U.S. didn't appeal if that case wasn't successfully, partly just to establish their rights. So that, those are the data that I wanted to, wanted to show you. I, I'm willing to answer some questions, too. I think we've gotten ourselves almost back on time. And welcome, Secretary Ross. I said very nice things about you before you got here. <laughs> so because You recorded that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I knew they'd record it, so I said nice things about you. Thank you, Dan. I was talking about the export program that we've been doing for 20-some years. I had a communication with Secretary Veneman the other day and, and mentioned to her that the program that she started that long ago was still being supported and, and, and vigorously so by the department. Made her, I think she had felt a little bit proud she had cr helped create that uh, <laughs> that many years ago. That's great. Well, Dan, I, I did have a question concerning... Uh, the implementation of these tariffs. I mean, we've, we've seen the administration come out, you know, at a level up here and then with a goal of ending somewhere else, a little lower, yeah. somewhere in the middle. Um, and and with, the, with regards to, you know, the, the nut crops that we have here, you know, almonds in particular, and, uh, and I'm sure Richard will speak to pistachios, but, you know, we've seen an, a non-ending planting throughout California. And I guess at, at some point, are we going to reach saturation? And, and will tariffs get us there quicker? Or how, will, how do you see that affecting the market down the road? Yeah, so it, it's certainly true. Almonds are one of these cases where we the total exports of almonds are 60% or so, uh, upwards of that year to year. Uh, pistachios sometimes uh, even higher. Uh, so, so the world market for almonds is crucial. China's a big part of the world. Now, could, could India grow fast enough and open themselves up enough uh, that, that, that I think they will also be a big market? Uh, you know, uh, my wife points out to me an almond orchard we didn't buy 20 years ago because I said, gee, this, how high could this go? <laughs> so I'm a little modest about, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I do, you know, and half the people in the room could, could point to an almond orchard they should have bought if only they would have known. But, um, but I do think, uh, so I'm not one to say, oh, there must be a limit. It's, it's this many acres is the most we could, we could do. I happen to know that everybody else in the world who's got anything close to a Mediterranean climate is also looking at almonds. And we've had, uh, they have a hard time competing with us because our almond industry is just that good at it, similar to, with pistachios. Uh, and, and we we basically uh, beat Spain into submission such that they're a major importer now. But there are other places, and Chile we know is in the, in the nut business, and Portugal and southern Spain now as opposed to the Valencia area and other places. So, uh, so uh, I, how much longer does it have to run? Gee, we've got three or four uh, hundred thousand acres of almonds that aren't yet bearing. So first we've got to digest that part of the the thing before we think about the new plantings. Uh, we'll see there. I will say one thing about going back to our bee story. 
is the most important thing for honeybees is the almond industry because it's a nationally half the revenue of the almond in, of, of the honeybee industry comes from that one month and a half period. Uh, so it's a it's remarkable for the health of the honeybee industry as well as the uh, the almond industry. Certainly, a disruption to China is a big deal for the industry, uh, particularly if that spills over to disrupting the shipments that go into Hong Kong. And we haven't heard anything from Beijing that says we're going to start. Uh, I mean, presumably, legally, they th they have the right to raise tariffs into Hong Kong too if they wanted to. But we haven't heard any rhetoric like that, and and they haven't threatened that. So that seems to be further away. Uh, and I wouldn't suggest it to them. So if there's a recording here, edit out that last few <laughs> uh, seconds. Uh, yeah, so I don't know how far almonds going. China's a big deal for almonds. China and Hong Kong together is a big deal for almonds. And uh, it, the, I mean, Europe is a bigger deal. So if you start t having trade rhetoric suggesting uh, almonds would be more vulnerable going into Europe, uh, I think, than, than they would be into China because of the Hong Kong situation. Dan, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn around, being, your, a bit, <laughs> being the veteran in the industry. Food safety is one of the biggest things that we have in this country versus China, obviously, having visited many farms there. Uh, but also there's a middle class that appreciates food safety and quality of product. What are you hearing from that side about this um, potential lack of products from USA into the, into the marketplace? both from the market and the legislators? Yeah, well, I don't. Uh, uh, people in business here are much uh, closer to their buyers in China than I would be. Uh, I was in China in, uh, uh, I guess the last time was in October, and uh, talked to lots of buyers there, went through some markets. I was there for academic reasons, not not as a consumer. or a sell I wasn't selling anything other than ideas, I guess, and I was giving those away. Um, the the, uh, uh, the 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 biggest headlines, if you'll recall, was in the dairy product area, where middle class buyers in China simply don't trust Chinese dairy products, and and that's just true across the board. Their major source is still New Zealand, but that's why we're shipping lots of dry milk powder and related whey products to China. Uh, they they you know partly price, but partly it's trust. Uh, I think that's true for lots of products, so you're right there. I've heard that as well for uh, uh, processed uh, tomato products, for example. They have, a, they have a, a tomato paste industry in China, but they don't trust that either. And that's a, that will improve. We, those, of, those of us that have been watching China for a long time, uh, nobody thought, pe people who weren't close to it said, oh, well, they can't be in the car business because obviously they can't make cars that are safe. Well, they are in a car business. And they're even exporting some cars. So I, I wouldn't discount their ability to get their act together. Uh, talented people who work hard, so they'll get their act together. And they know that they can read a lack of trust. But it does uh, remind us, if you lose trust in a market, boy, you've lost a lot because it takes a long time to get that back. And, and their dairy industry uh, lost that trust, and, and who knows when they'll get it back. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I, I had a question that the about the bilateral deficit concept. It seems like you unequivocally state in that ac uh, macroeconomic viewpoint that it's not important, yet that's what we keep hearing from yeah. other parties, that it's the trade deficit that's the motivation for a lot of this. W where's the disconnect? What am I missing? I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, I th I've, I've never heard an economist who works on macroeconomic sort of issues, which is what the trade deficit is. It's economy-wide sort of a concept, and you've got exchange rates relate to that. You know, we've got a U.S. yuan uh, uh, exchange rate that can be adjusted. You've got the Chinese buying, I don't know, somebody told me the other night in L.A., uh, umpteen trillion dollars worth of U.S. Uh, 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 Treasury bonds, for example. But I haven't heard any economist, a macro, uh, anybody that pays attention to macroeconomics say that bilateral trade deficits mean anything. Uh, now, we could end bilateral trade deficit with China. You know, presumably we could put up a, a wall, so to speak, a trade wall, and quit importing from China, in which case we'd have essentially no trade deficit because we'd have no trade. We'd have no exports there and no imports from China. 
uh, uh, we'd have a hit to our economy, they'd have one to theirs, nobody's proposing this, uh, but the, uh, we'd still be running a trade deficit because the trade deficit is balanced by monetary flows. W when, when they ship us more goods than we ship them in value, uh, uh, they end up with dollars as a consequence. We're buying with dollars. And those dollars are going to go somewhere. And what they do with their dollars is buy our bonds. Those dollars, if we're still in the U.S., and this goes back to the other macro macroeconomic relationships, if we're still going to have better investment opportunities uh, than the savings in the United States, there's dollars going to flow in the U.S. to make those investments. Or you could call them loans if you'd like. We're borrowing from all the around the world. They're investing in bonds and real assets in the United States. That's good for us in the sense that our economy can grow because we have investment when we don't save that much. And, and so, so the only way you balance that is with a trade deficit. And, and so at the same time we have a rhetoric about trade deficits, we're running a federal budget deficit that is substantial enough to in a sense, drive that tr some of that trade. I don't want to go into the macroeconomic details at all because I don't think it's really relevant. But if if a year from now, uh, trade deficits move around, but I don't think there's any chance that the administration will say, oh, look, we've got great success because the U.S. trade deficit went down substantially. Unless we got in a recession, then we'd be buying less stuff, but nobody's suggesting that as a remedy. And in fact, the trade deficit went up, not down, uh, last year because the economy is doing pretty well. And, and so you, you, the, all those relationships are going on at the same time. But I'll stand by the original remark, that is, the bilateral trade deficit is not a meaningful, useful concept for us in thinking about these issues. Um, Two quick Hi. questions. Thank you so much. Um, excellent um, report. Um, uh, I want to just follow up on Martha's comment. Do you have a sense of how much um, of the products that we are exporting that are coming from California are branded versus unbranded? Um, because I do think this issue of safety is a really important one. Having lived in China, having lived in Asia, that's a, um, a big question on many, many. You, you cited some of the most important dairy and tomatoes and other products, but that's a really huge issue for the consumers. Yeah. So uh, how much of the California brand uh, it gets com communicated to the consumers is one question. And then um, just you raised such an interesting point there about uh, the different ways one can export products. Uh, and to some extent, it's interesting that the products that you've cited that we export a lot to of China are ones that have high water content and usage. And to some extent, you could almost extrapolate that at some level we're exporting water to China. Just wonder if you could comment on that a little bit, too. Yeah, so, so let me say first about uh, Brandon. I haven't seen that data. But, but uh, uh, it doesn't have to have a California brand or, for that matter, a New Zealand brand if it's dry milk powder for the buyer to know that because uh, the, it may have a Chinese brand on it, uh, but, cons but say sourced from, and so long as people trust that, or it may have some uh, international brand uh, that people trust because they know the source is California. So you can have a tomato paste that's got some brand on it so long as they believe that it's coming from uh, California or someplace like California that they trust. As you know, that it, it doesn't have, have to have a brand, uh, the brand itself. So I think the fact that, it, that the paste may go to China in bulk uh, doesn't, uh, uh, so we may, it, it's not a branded export, but it, it may get a brand after it gets there that signals to those consumers. Uh, and you're right, uh, uh, some of what we send uh, particularly the stuff goes into Hong Kong, uh, maybe, but when I was talking about almonds, it may go, it may be a container load of almonds that then is packaged in Hong Kong. It may have a California brand on it at, at, at some stage, or it may not. The, they know they're not, cons they're not, they're not consuming Chinese almonds because there aren't any, or none to speak of. So they know those are, those are ours, the consumers would. And so just the other, just to follow up on that, so the question of whether or not products 
I think you're so right about going to China versus going to Hong Kong and beginning to separate that out because yeah. to the extent that the Chinese government controls Hong Kong much more significantly now than it did many yeah. years ago. Yeah. Their ability to bring products into Hong Kong mm -hmm. and uh, reformulate them in such a way that their source and origin is confusing to the Chinese consumer, that actually too could be a tool for um, trade uh, bargaining. I yeah, it, and, and you know, I. Um, uh, and you probably know better than I do. I would think the Chinese consumer, if 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 I'm off in 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 uh, Shanghai, I may trust a product coming from Hong Kong more than I trust a product coming from Western China, for example. Uh, eat, and, and partly because they know it's not produced, in, they know it's not a Hong Kong farm product. No, nobody gets confused on that point. So they know it's coming from from somewhere that they would trust more than some of the, some of their own operations. Uh, you asked about water, um, and uh, agriculture uses a lot of water. It doesn't matter what the product is. I don't know of a farm product that isn't, doesn't have a lot of water content in it. So I don't think that's it, food. It takes a lot of water to grow a plant, and animals eat plants, so everything's going to have water. That, that's just a fact. Uh, dry milk powder has a lot of water in it in the sense of the alfalfa hay and the silage and all that. Uh, so, so any food product we export is going to have a lot of water. There's no question about it. Interestingly enough, and I've written on this a little bit, uh, one of the products that has the least water is actually beef. But I want to be careful about that. That's drought-relevant water. Because if you know, and for that matter, some of the poultry products, we bring unit trains full of Midwest water, so to speak, corn and soybeans, which, is, uh, which has nothing to do with our drought. It's not our water, so to speak. It's their water. They ship it to us. We feed it to our livestock. And the other is, for the beef industry particularly, a lot of that's based on grazing. And that's not water that's relevant to the drought either. That water is going to, whether it's snow, you know, most of the pasture land is not irrigated for the beef industry, the cow-calf industry. So those, those are not, in a sense, drought-relevant water. And, and what, what uh, uh, we did a lot of work on this sort of stuff during the drought, and I talked to this board once or twice, and my colleague Richard Howitt, uh, did many times over over that period. Let's hope it's all gone. We never have to come back to this board talking about the drought. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, but but I do think uh, a lesson to consumers and people in general is just agriculture is going to use a bunch of water in, in in a place like in a lot of it in California is going to be irrigation water, no matter what. That's just a fact. And and uh, I I tell my friends in the in the walnut industry, you're so lucky that walnut begins with a W. <laughs> Because the press stopped with almonds and, and, and alfalfa and never got all the way down to W in terms of pointing the finger. And, and uh, luck of the draw there, I guess, for, for them. But, uh, but you're, you're right. We ship what, if you ship agricultural products, you ship water. No question about it. Well, Dan, we're running, we're running a little late on time Sorry here. Thank you. For, no, I appreciate your comments and uh, the question from our board here were really good. So thank you for your time here today. Okay. Yep. Bye bye. All right. Uh, Josh, our next speaker is by Skype. Yeah. Okay. So we have the Wine Institute joining us via Skype. And so we'll do that portion of the panel first and then have the panelists follow All up. All right. After that. So our, our next uh, speaker via Skype is Lindsay Gallagher. Uh, who's the vice president of the international marketing, uh, vice president of international marketing located in San Francisco with the uh, Wine Institute. So we'll wait and see if, uh, there we go. Excellent. <laughs> well, welcome, uh, Lindsay, we'll go ahead and let you uh, start and, uh, we're discussing tariffs and the uh, and their effect on California ag products today, and we want definitely want to include the uh, the wine industry. So, so welcome to our board meeting. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice to see some familiar faces in the room um, in Sacramento. <laughs> Hi, Joy. Hi, Secretary. <laughs> I feel like I've become the. Uh, reluctant poster child for the California wine tariff these days, but we are getting a lot of immediate attention on this subject. So thank you for um, including me today and for inviting me to speak on the wine piece of the puzzle. My colleague in Washington, D.C., Charles Jefferson, had intended to join us today, but got pulled into a meeting with uh, USTR on this very subject. So it was important that he uh, continue to fly our flag in that conversation. So 
sends his regrets. But um, in any event, I'm going to try to share my screen here um, if it will let me. Uh, and so hopefully you can follow along. Are you able to see my slides now? OK, perfect. So um, I thought I would start just by giving a little bit of a category update on California wines and our exports and how China fits into that so you understand the potential impact um, of this latest development that started right after April Fool's Day for us on uh, April 2nd. So um, on the screen, you'll see a chart of our U.S. wine exports for the past 10 years. We finished last year at 1.53 billion U.S. dollars. That was down slightly from the past three years where we had um, uh, had, had higher numbers, but that's primarily due to some currency fluctuation as well as some um, challenges with trade-related agreements um, uh, where our competitors have a favorable scenario, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 95% um, of U.S. wine exports come from California, and um, as I think I said, we were up around 70% over the last 10 years, so a nice growth trend. Um, this next slide will show you our U.S. wine exports by region and where the top um, areas are for our wine exports. So. Uh, at the top of the list is the European Union, the EU, um, with about 40 to 45 percent, depending on the year, um, of our sales going to the EU. That's led by the UK, by uh, the, the largest market within the EU right now, uh, by far. And then Germany and the Scandinavian countries are also um, contributing <clears throat> primarily to that number for the EU. Canada is our single largest individual market, with about 30 to 35 percent of our sales going to Canada. Um, and then Hong Kong, Japan, and China round out the top five for California wine exports, um, with about 15 to 18 percent of our sales going to those markets. And Asia is really a growth engine overall for California wine exports. China is now the fifth largest market, and our sales to China are up more than 300 percent over the past 10 years. So in 2017, we exported $14 million of California wine to China. Last year, it was just under $79 million. So um, a really significant market for us, and one, um, as I'll talk about in a second, with a lot of growth potential for us. Um, this is the, the stats to China on, a, I guess, a 12-year trend now, but you see sort of starting in 2009 and 10, um, and certainly in the last five to seven years, a real increase in our sales to China, um, and that's largely a result of, um, of the, the Wine Institute's program in China and the efforts of our member wineries who have been investing both time, um, energy, and, and money into the, the China market to help establish a stronghold for brand California wines. Um, the, the great news there is that we really have started to see um, consumers in China connecting with California as a place um, and also as a world-class wine producing region. We work very closely with the Visit California team. Um, Carolyn Batetta and her international team are doing an amazing program all over the world, of course, but certainly in um, mainland China. And um, we're able to, um, to work with them on that iconic, aspirational messaging for California as a place. And then we can talk about our world-class wine producing region on top of their um, key messages. So it's a, it's a great partnership for us and one that um, you know, it, it, it's been very successful for us. As you may know, Chinese consumers, there's a, a strong emerging middle class in China. And Chinese consumers, for the first time in the last five or so years, are able to afford luxury goods and, um, and items like whether they're sunglasses or purses or watches. Those are very um, aspirational things in China um, and, and from the West in particular. Um, and, and California wine fits very nicely into that, um, uh, the consideration set for those folks who have disposable income and are of the emerging middle class. So that really has helped us build a very strong uh, connection with California as a place with our wines and helped us to be able to start to compete finally in that market. So that makes the, the bad news slide that I have on my screen now even, uh, even more concerning. So this is the Wine Institute statement um, on the China tariff situation. And in a nutshell, what this means is that there's an additional 15% tariff that went into effect on April 2nd. Um, what this does is takes the tariff that we did have up, up until that point was just under 50, 50 zero percent. And now with the, um, with the multiplier factor, it brings us up to 67.7, so just under 70 percent uh, tax for U.S. wine going into China. By contrast, our, our wine producing competitors like Chile and New Zealand 
go into China tariff free. So they pay only the 27% tax. And Australian wine starting in 2019 will have um, a similar scenario. So they'll be going in at 27%. We're now going in at 67%. So needless to say, um, this makes the, the playing field for California wine exports extremely unlevel. Um, and uh, it, it's already challenge for, challenging for us to compete on um, labor and land cost compared to these other wine producing regions. And so to add this additional disadvantage um, you know, it, it is quite concerning for us. Um, anecdotally, we had a similar scenario back in 2009, I think it was, with Mexico, where there was a retaliatory trucking tariff that had nothing to do with wine. But over that time period, our, our sales into Mexico the year prior to this tariff had been 25 million. The following year when the tariff was in effect, it went down to 10 million, and it took us five years to get back to that $25 million number. So in theory, um, that's the, that, that is what the scenario could look like in China, where we have just about $80 million of sales um, right now. So it's a... Uh, it's really, um, you know, it's unfortunate. It's, it's, um, it's something that's not directly related to wine, but is, um, you know, impacting us at a time of great growth when we're, we're making great progress. Um, the last slide that I have here on the screen gives you, just to, shows you from a brand and marketing standpoint, California wine category has developed in, um, in China of late. And sort of in the upper right quadrant, you'll see the French flag and the Chinese flag. So that's um, where both awareness of the wines and conversion and consumption um, are happening. And so France, uh, you know, the, the takeaway for this is that France is the strongest uh, import wine category in China. Um, no surprise, they have great budgets and have, have made great efforts all around the world. Um, but what's, <clears throat> what's great news for us is you start to see California sort of in the middle of this slide, but we're breaking away from the pack of everybody else who's down in the lower left quadrant. And uh, we're waiting on the 2018 um, results for this study, but we're expecting California to even move further to the upper right of this quadrant, which is essentially a brand health um, snapshot of the wine category in China. Um, and then lastly, we've also made great gains for U.S. wines in terms of awareness, and conversion and consumption, all these key um, marketing and brand metrics um, in China, you see uh, all positive trends. And we expect those, as I said on the previous slide, to continue when the 2018 uh, study comes out. Um, but in the meantime, um, it's a tough scenario uh, for us and um, you know, one, that, one that's very concerning. What we're doing to respond to this is to try to find every um, ounce of spare change that we might have so that we can um, you know, maintain the confidence of our distribution network and of our um, importer partners in the market. They, of course, carry wine from California and France and Australia and New Zealand and everywhere else. And, and what would, you know, what the typical response to a situation like this is for them to say, well, maybe we're gonna focus more on French or Australian wines right now because they don't have this um, additional tariff uh, scenario. So we have to, you know, we're redoubling our marketing efforts to support uh, the category and our, our importer and trade partners in the market um, in the short term and are holding our breath and crossing our fingers and toes that in the long term um, this will be resolved because we have a pretty robust program in the China market and we've made great progress um, and this really has the potential to, to set us back for a while. So with that, um, that's uh, you know what I hope to share with all of you. I'm happy to to answer questions or expand further on some of the efforts we're making on the Washington DC side to, to try to um, level set the scenario. But um, that's that was all I had from a presentation standpoint. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, really, really a great presentation. Um, we'll go ahead, uh, have a couple questions. Go ahead, Andy. We don't, yeah. go ahead. Lindsay, uh, very good presentation. Um, I was just in China, I just got back last Wednesday uh, in the Xi'an area, and that's a growth area for their wine region or that whole region there. We went to some supermarkets and some upscale wine shops, and we saw numerous cases. I was with a number of our uh, faculty, uh, three of them actually, and one was a marketer, an enology and viticulturist, and, and it was interesting, the number of um, uh, counterfeit wines that we saw in each location. And we, our Chinese counterparts who were guiding us through this said it's a real problem. How, how are you addressing that? Yeah, you know, it, it, it is a significant problem for us. It's even 
you know, more so for our competitors, I would say. I think French wine is being counterfeit, um, you know, much more than California. Um, Australian wine, on my last trip, I saw um, in a supermarket a bottle of what we would call Penfolds with a P, and it was Benfolds with a B. Um, if you're a, a Chinese consumer, you know, I, I couldn't tell if they changed the character, you know, a, a Chinese They, they did change the character, yeah. by the way. I, they I took it from a... It was the same <laughs> script, but it was Benfolds with a B. Yeah. Um, and we've seen Carlo Rossi with, you know, at the lower end of the California spectrum, Carlo Rossi with a, with an L instead of, a, you know, because they pronounce the R as an L, so Carlo Rossi, as we would say. So um, anyway, it's it's sadly prevalent. And I think, um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a, a measure of success for us. The more that we are counterfeit, I think, is showing that California wine is even more desirable um, and, and a badge good in this scenario. So our, our DC team, um, you know, is working with um, the, their counterparts on, uh, you know, on, on, the, on the Treasury side and on the um, State Department and, and other areas to make sure that that wine is added to the list of products that are being counterfeit um, and, and that we're addressing it. The reality is, you know, when you have the, the Silicon Valley products and, and many other categories that are um, uh, Hollywood, the entertainment industry, and movies. There, there's a long list of things um, that that the current administration is hoping we can resolve, um, including wine, um, as a result of this tariff. But um, you know, for the short term, we we're just trying to um, uh, you know sort of consolidate where this counterfeit is happening. Um, and at, at the moment, it's not concerning enough. Um, you know, for, for again, the wineries see it as almost a positive thing that, that we know that it's happening to France and Australia, the category leaders. So when it's happening um, to us, we, we see it as a good thing. There are also, you know, uh, there's a lot of technology um, available now, for, you know, at a bottle level where you can, um, you can scan and track the bottle when it leaves California all the way across the ocean and, and through the distribution network anywhere in the world but in China. And so some of our more premium partners are... Um, are starting to implement that technology so it's sort of third party tracking and verification if wine ends up in an auction or a collector scenario um you certainly can uh, validate and authenticate with these um new very um you know uh, non-intrusive technologies it's just a you know a, a scan either in the cork or in the label um that's invisible to most folks but we can track that way <laughs> thank you very much uh for the, okay. Okay. So, I just have a quick question on the sure. data. Um, you reported here, I think, 1.5 billion total exports. What's the total value of the U.S. wine? Like, what's the what's the relative? 1.5 billion relative to what total? Yeah, so we, it's 20% of California's production is exported. So um, any given year, it's somewhere between 19 and 21%. And um, the, the U.S. wine market uh, uh, has been growing for the last, I think, 20 consecutive, 23 consecutive years here. So the category at home has grown, and as you saw on my first slide, exports overall has grown. Um, but we, um, back of the envelope, export 20%. And as you may know, California is the fourth largest wine producer in the world, behind France, Italy, and Spain. So, thank you. Great. Lindsay, we really appreciate your time today. Uh, great to have you uh, with us. So thanks again. Thanks for including me. It was nice to see you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye now. So we're going to move on to our panel discussion. Uh, Richard Matoyan with the American Pistachio Growers, Casey Kramer, California Citrus Mutual, John Talbot, California Milk Advisory Board. Uh, Richard Matoyan is the Executive Director of the American Pistachio Growers, a nonprofit agricultural trade association representing more than 625 grower entities in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, Casey Kramer is the Executive Vice President of the California Citrus Mutual, consists of 2,500 members and represents 75% of the California citrus industry. And John Talbot, CEO of California Milk Advisory Board, one of the largest egg uh, marketing boards in the nation representing California dairy families. So welcome, Richard. Good to see you. Yeah, good morning, and thank you for having me here. Um, I thought I'd start off by giving you some uh, information about the California pistachio industry as uh, a bit of background. Um, some of this information you may already be familiar with. California produces 99% of the nation's pistachios. The other producing states, commercial producing states, are Arizona and New Mexico. 
And of that 99% that's produced here in California, 97% is between Merced, to, Merced County to the north, Kern County to the south. So really think about the San Joaquin Valley as being the heart of the pistachio producing area. There are uh, nearly 330,000 acres planted in the California, a significant increase really uh, over about a dozen years ago. Um, and 250,000 of those are now bearing. Pistachios are now a top 10 commodity within the state of California. Uh, really came out of obscurity in the last number of years to be within the top 10 commodities. And we are either the fourth or fifth largest uh, exported commodity, depending upon the year examined. Um, the U.S. became the largest producer of pistachios in 2008 surpassing the country of Iran. Uh, and with the exception of 2015, in which we had a disaster year due to a lack of water, lack of rainfall, and lack of chilling hours, uh, we will remain as the top producer uh, in the world um, going into the future. And just as a note, uh, even though there's a small amount of bearing acres in Arizona, uh, a significant amount of new acres have been planted there recently, uh, including many California growers who have moved to there. Cheaper land, less regulation, uh, same kind of growing conditions in a particular uh, area of, of that state. So we see a, just a tremendous increase uh, going on there. Uh, this next slide is showing our production. Uh, one thing you will note about pistachios is that they are alternate bearing. So bearing a large crop, or we call an on-year crop, and then the next year um, followed by a short or an off-year crop. Um, that trend doesn't always follow. We can have multiple years of increase or multiple years of decrease. Uh, if you look to the far right of the chart, you can see the, the disastrous 2015 crop that we had followed by our largest crop in history in 2016. This is really a chart is showing our entire history from about 1979 through to the present, and you can really see this rapid increase in production over the last dozen years as a result of the number of acres of pistachios planted in the state. So total shipments. Uh, this is showing from the year 2005 through the last fiscal year, which ended uh, August 31, 2017. Um, so this is not showing current, uh, but I can give you some, some current information. I wanted to show complete fiscal years. So you can see that we've had upward trends, and yet we had been going down in total shipments, really as a result of the lack of production really coming from 2015 and 2014, uh, but then picking back up once we produce that large crop in 2016. So when we break that down now by domestic shipments, um, our domestic market has been relatively stable, and with the, uh, the large uh, production that we had in 2016, prices really moderated. Uh, consumers are really only you know, willing to pay X amount per pound, and when they, when they go over about $10 a pound, uh, then we see a drop-off. But we saw this increase in sales at the domestic level really as a result of the large crop and the moderating price. But exports are really where we see um, our, our bright future. And you can see, similar to the domestic market, we were trending upward, but we had a few bad years, so they went down, and yet in 2016-17, our market picked right back up, not only picked up, but really doubled and almost tripled in size from the previous year as a result of moderating prices and, and a number of other factors. Um, the, the food quality standards that we have here in the United States compared with our competitors, um, lack of competitors around the world being able to produce a crop, uh, really allowed us to gain market share. So now let's look at specific export markets around the world. Western Europe has traditionally been our number one export destination up until recently. Um, so they've been a very stable market, seen some ups, seen some downs, but again have seen a positive trend 
uh, in the last year. Look at this chart, Eastern Europe. And we were doing quite well in Eastern Europe, but all of a sudden, right around 2014, they dropped off. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, we had uh, the sanctions imposed against Russia, and they in turn banned all agricultural products. So we saw a growing market there in Eastern Europe, and particularly Russia, that was lost as a result of those, those sanctions that were put into place that blocked all ag exports into Russia. However, we have other parts of the world, the Middle East and Africa, where we've seen some incredible increases. Uh, we went from about um, 10 million pounds to now 35 million pounds in the Middle East and Africa. So good opportunities in other parts of the world. But our shining star, I must say, is China and Hong Kong. Uh, if you look to the far left of the chart, where we were shipping somewhere around three to five million pounds per year, yet in this last year, we shipped over 220 million pounds to China and Hong Kong. They are taking up now 55% of all of our pistachio exports. 55% are going to China and Hong Kong. And just a few years ago, we would say 25% were going to China and Hong Kong of our exports. Now it's 55%. So they are a significant marketplace. And we all know why that is. Uh, they have a, a growing middle class with more disposable income. Pistachios are a good source of plant-based proteins. And people are t trending away from animal-based proteins to plant-based based proteins. So tree nuts in general and pistachios do well in that category with having a good amount of plant-based proteins. Uh, our pistachio uh, bearing acres, uh, current in green and expected in uh, the maroon color. So you can see that we have more acres that are coming into production, which will then translate in the blue to even larger and larger crops. So we need each and every marketplace that we can garner to be able to market our pistachios. Um, I have a very short video that I was going to, to show you, but before I do, I was going to give you some more uh, information about the situation in China, because that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, first of all, we talk about the official trade channels uh, and the unofficial trade channels, uh, sometimes also referred to as the gray market channels. Um, as Dan had showed from the information from the University of California, we have a tremendous amount, most of our product going into Hong Kong, not into mainland China. But if we look at the data into mainland China, they have been steadily increasing over the last number of years. Uh, shipments that have gone into Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Beijing in particular. But, but um, Hong Kong has been our destination spot. Some of that product can go unofficially into China, but we know talking with our traders that much of it goes to other parts of the world, mostly other parts of Southeast Asia, and even occasionally, we will find product that was sold into China, into Hong Kong, finding its way, competing with us in Western Europe. So it's interesting how these trade channels work. Um, the reports that we have received from our traders indicate that about two weeks ago, um, some ports were implementing the tariff, other ports were not implementing the tariff, and yet other ports were quarantining or holding the product at port, not knowing exactly what to do. And I think that would be a typical situation that you would find when you're implementing something new and the word is now filtering down to uh, the, the local levels on exactly what is going to be done. Uh, we are hearing now that the tariffs are being implemented across the board at all uh, mainland China ports. 
Uh, we have also heard that the unofficial marketing channels, um, that there's tightening at the borders. Um, a lot of product that would go into Vietnam, into the port of Haiphong. Uh, we may remember Haiphong from um, the Vietnam War days as that port being mined by President Johnson. That is now a major port of destination for a lot of our products going into Vietnam or into Vietnam and then finding their way possibly into, into China. Um, we're hearing much of the, uh, the borders being tightened. Um, however, at the same time, we're hearing that there's a spike in interest in California pistachios from Turkey, Dubai, Australia, and India. So these are more of these unofficial channels of product finding their way into mainland China from other traditional or potentially new sources uh, for California product. So the question you, you have is what's been the impact on California pistachios? And right now it's really impossible to say. Uh, during your Skype feed, Veronica from the Farm Bureau said, China has been good at finding other suppliers. Well, that may be true for some commodities, but not true for all commodities. Because if you want to buy almonds, if you want to buy pistachios, there's really only a few sources that you can source the product from. In the case of pistachios, it's either the United States or the country of Iran. And in fact, if, we, if you go back and look at our uh, sales to China um, and Hong Kong, part of the reason why we had a downward trend until recently was the fact that we had small crops, but also the country of Iran, our largest competitor around the world, had two large crops in 2014 and in 2015. So when they have large crops and they don't have the ability to store their commodity longer than about one year, whereas in the US we're able to store it for multiple years. So they, whatever they grow in a particular year, they have to sell. So they have a large crop, where are they gonna go? They're gonna go to their uh, countries that are close by to them. In China, uh, India, have been major ports or, or countries of destination for the, the product grown in Iran. Um, so short term, we, we don't see much going on um, besides the confusion in implementing the, the, the new tariffs. But long-term, it potentially could be an issue if this lingers on. Um, so, and a lot does have to do with what is going to be produced in the country of, of Iran. We estimate that we're going to have an on-year or a large crop this year. So uh, we'll have plenty of product to sell. Iran apparently had a freeze in many of their uh, major regions. So we anticipate that they uh, are going to have a very short crop. So if China wants to buy pistachios, they really are only going to be able to source it from the United States. And like you, when I went this morning and, got and bought my cafe latte, did I note that it was 15% higher than the day previous? I didn't look at the price. Uh, buyers certainly may look at the price, but our consumers looking at, at the price of their product each and every day when they go into the store. Certainly some consumers are, yet other consumers are, are, are not. So it yet remains to be seen exactly what impact all of this will have. I can tell you that no grower likes to see a tariff placed on their commodity. Uh, and certainly um, most, if not all, the other commodities, um, agricultural commodities that go into China already had a tariff. And that's been a misnomer that there, this is a new tariff. We already had a tariff of 5% going in on raw and 10% on roasted pistachios. Almonds had a 10, per, uh, yeah, almonds had a 10% tariff. Walnuts had a 10 or 15% tariff already in China. So we were doing well despite the fact that tariffs were already in place in China and in other parts of the world. So long story short, we don't like to see tariffs placed on our product. It, put, it puts us potentially at a competitive disadvantage, 
and we would like to see this issue resolved as quickly as possible. And before I, I finish up, I just have about a two minute video I wanted to show you on pistachios. In 1930, William Whitehouse brought pistachio seeds from Persia to the ideal growing conditions in California. This was the beginning of the ethereal delicacy that would eventually become the nut that is number one for its flavor, the American pistachio. Mr. Whitehouse sparked a research revolution with this little nut whose culinary tradition dates back millennia, resulting in an improved pistachio with surprising health benefits. One serving of American-grown pistachios has only 160 calories, fewer calories and grams of fat than most other nuts per serving. Only almonds contain the same amount of protein per serving, but because pistachios are lower in fat, you get 49 nuts per serving, extending your pleasure. One serving has as much potassium as a half of a large banana, and more fiber than half a cup of broccoli. The combination of protein and fiber makes the American-grown pistachio not only a healthy choice, but also filling. In addition to containing essential vitamins and minerals, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, these nuts are delicious. Since 2008, the United States has surged as a market leader for pistachios worldwide, and American pistachios are regarded to be of the highest quality. American-grown pistachios are harvested mechanically, and to ensure they are safe, never touch the ground in the process. And because American orchards employ the most modern technologies in cultivation and are grown in ideal conditions, they yield a high percentage of naturally ripened, naturally opened nuts bursting with flavor. Pistachios from other countries are sometimes bleached or dyed to hide shell discoloration that occurs from drying on the ground, which can give them an acidic taste. In contrast, American pistachios have a buttery, sweet taste and naturally tanned shell. The pistachio is a droop, that is, a stone fruit, and like other droops, they're more flavorful when they're allowed to ripen perfectly on the tree. The pistachio shell forms first, then fills with the nut meat inside. When the nut exceeds the size of the shell, it is ripe and will naturally split the shell open. This is the peak of its flavor. Shelled as snacks, roasted, crushed, ground into paste, for savory foods, confections, and baked goods, or sweet desserts. American pistachios bring a pleasing and unique color, texture, and flavor to any part of the meal. A wholesome ingredient in foods sweet or savory grown with the highest standards of quality in the American West. American-grown pistachios, amazing flavor and powerful nutrition in every shell. And now that I've made you hungry, I did bring some pistachios for the board to sample. Uh, Josh is uh, keeping him back until lunchtime. Right. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't want to dirty up the tables. So with that, I just, uh, just want to thank you for your time and I appreciate all the effort that uh, you put on um, on behalf of California agriculture. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate your uh, presentation and having you up here. Uh, we're going to wait till we finish up and then we'll have questions if you don't mind, Nancy. Thank you. Go ahead, Casey. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the board, Secretary Ross, Casey Creamer, California Citrus Mutual. Just, uh, I'm going to start off with just a couple, a couple of numbers, but uh, get a little bit more of substance, uh, substance of how uh, California Citrus Mutual is addressing the Chinese trade um, issue that we have before us right now. Uh, so, like uh, President Cameron said earlier, uh, it's California Citrus Mutual. There's about 270,000 acres uh, in California of, of fresh citrus. Uh, it is a, I don't know if you said this, Joel, we'll may, ha, have to repeat this all the time, but it's a $3.4 billion industry here in California. So very significant uh, crop here in, in California. Um, we represent on the economic, regulatory, and uh, political issues that uh, affect citrus growers the most. Um, we also do get into trade uh, as well, but we are not a, a marketing organization like some of the organizations that present a lot better charts and, and numbers uh, before you uh, here this morning. Um, as we have been heavily involved in trade issues over the last few years, uh, Joel Nelson, our president, uh, currently serves as the chairman of the uh, Fruit and Vegetable uh, uh, Trade Advisory Committee, Agricultural Trade Advisory Committee to USDA. 
work uh, very cooperatively with the administration, the current administration and past administration uh, on trade issues that affect citrus industry. We have uh, close contact with Ted McKinney, the undersecretary at USDA, uh, Greg Dowd, the special assistant or the agriculture ne negotiator at, at USTR, and uh, with Ray Starling, special assistant uh, ag advisor to the, the president. So we remain in close contact with the administration and uh, working uh, with them as uh, they address uh, this important critical is issue uh, on our behalf. Uh, so specifically for citrus, what does this mean for us? This recent uh, uh, decision by the Chinese government, uh, it is a 15. We are, uh, as of April 2nd, we are, have uh, a 15 percent uh, increase in the current tariff that we had uh, right now. So that is in place. Uh, we had a, a 11 percent uh, tariff uh, prior to the, the recent decision uh, by the Chinese. We do about 137 uh, million dollars. We did about 137 million dollars of business uh, last year uh, in in China. So let me uh, go back to the, uh, our uh, Citrus Mutual response to the action. And we put out a press release. We were uh, on the way uh, to Washington, D.C. to have meetings with uh, the administration uh, officials that we noted before, along with several of the other uh, staff at those agencies as well. And trade uh, was elevated to the uh, top of the agenda once the announcement was made on August 2nd. It surprised us. We weren't expecting it. We were supposed to have a 30-day comment period. Uh, and then that was about a week later, uh, they just imposed the tariffs uh, automatically. We were in our press release, uh, we were supportive of the administration um, and said it in, no doubt will have effects on, on California citrus growers and also Chinese consumers. There's, there's two people uh, suffering with, with these uh, in, uh, imposition of, of trade. But why did we take a, a, a little bit different response than, than some of the other uh, groups? We believe that the administration and the current staff's working there are, are sometimes our best advocates when it comes to trade. We, we can't be everywhere, and they, they do a darn good job on our behalf. And the other thing was the president ran on trade. He got elected, and so our job is to work with whoever gets elected to try to minimize or, or work through the channels uh, available to us to make sure our, our industry is uh, adequately uh, represented. And so we continue to work uh, with the administration as they seek to remedy the issues with the Chinese government. We was talked about her earlier today, the uh, intellectual property issues and the other uh, issues that are uh, prevalent within China. Uh, past administrations have tried to address the issue and have not been uh, successful. And so this administration is uh, true to their word uh, through the election process, is taking trade up as a priority issue for them. And so uh, we're hopeful that uh, they're gonna be successful because if this was, if this was the citrus industry that was, um, facing the same impacts that the steel, aluminum, and other industries were facing uh, uh, with regards to China. We would want our administration to, to uh, help us in those regards as well. And so we know that there are serious issues uh, there with intellectual properties and others, and we're supporting our, our administration. We just hope that, you know, it all works out and uh, it doesn't go on too long because the quickest remedy to this issue is um, uh, a quick solution. and, and uh, a uh, movement past uh, the rhetoric and, and actual solutions. But at this point in time, you know, we're, we're behind our government and hoping for a quick uh, resolution. So we're going to remain heavily in, involved on in this issue. Uh, our, our growers are committed and, and behind the administration as they work towards trying to resolve this issue uh, with, with China, but they're also prepared uh, for this to be an extended time period. Uh, we are uh, continuing to meet with the administration and we're going to be back there next week as well, working on, on these issues uh, to try to uh, provide input that, that, that we can, because it, it is true that uh, several in the administration uh, don't understand quite the agriculture industry and especially the California industry. And so that's our job as advocates for California agriculture to make them aware of those issues. So as they go and work with the Chinese government and others to uh, remedy this situation, that they have the best information uh, possible. So that's our role and how we're responding to uh, this particular issue, and uh, uh, thank you for the time and opportunity to be here today, and we'll be glad to answer any questions you may have uh, at the conclusion of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Casey. John? Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. I'm going to have a slightly different uh, take on this topic. 
uh, given that so far at least we have not hit the China retaliation tariff list. Um, so, uh, but that does not mean that we don't have our issues uh, with China. We, in fact, we have significant market access issues that have been plaguing the California dairy industry for quite some time. So just to jump into this, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of the California dairy industry and where our milk goes. We produce here about 40 billion pounds of milk. Um, that has an economic, a direct economic impact to the state of California of about $21 billion. When we look at where does that milk go, about a third of it stays here in California, products that are sold in California. About a third of it goes to the balance of the U.S. And then almost a third of it goes into export products. So you can tell uh, if $21 billion of economic value, uh, about a third of that, maybe we'll call it $6 billion of economic value uh, just from dairy exports. So it's a significant amount of business that we do overseas. Where does that go? This is just Asia, okay? China is about a third of it. Uh, then Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan. Mexico, however, is three times as big as China for us. I didn't even put Mexico on here because it would dwarf the scale of it. Uh, but between Mexico and China, that's at least 60% of our export business goes to those two countries. So for us right now, between NAFTA and, and what just was passed in terms of the European free trade agreement with Mexico, that puts a significant amount of our business in jeopardy. And then you look at China and where we are kind of precariously balanced right now uh, with that market, uh, again, there's a lot of business at stake here on the export side of things. <coughs> China, um, and this is through 2015 right here, uh, we had been growing uh, at, at a significant rate, and then all of a sudden there was this anomaly uh, where the market overpurchased and then stopped buying, and right about at that same time they introduced some new market access uh, requirements. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to say now that has rebounded uh, to a more normalized 13% uh, growth rate uh, in China right now. However, um, we still have some issues there. And one of them is that if you look on the lower right here, and I apologize, there's a lot on this slide, but the lower right shows you what we import into China right now. And it is almost exclusively whey and whey related products. Um, they're all the most, I'll say the lowest value commodity products in the dairy portfolio. Um, which is important to us, obviously, because of the volume, and we need to put the milk somewhere. Uh, so it goes into these milk powders and whey products. Um, but they trade on fractions of a penny margin. And the difference in holding a customer can be literally pennies. So when we look at the potential uh, for added tariffs in a, in a market like China, there's a huge impact. Huge, huge impact for us, potentially. Now, the other side of the coin is on the lower left there, you can see this is some Euromonitor data, and it's largely on the consumer side of things now, not the commodity or ingredients side of things, but looking at milk and yogurt as an example, uh, those first two, that's 2015 to 2020 growth potential. So you can see there's tremendous growth opportunity for dairy in the China market. And there's tremendous demand for that. The problem is, again, we have uh, a significant a number of market access issues in China. But before I get to the issues, I want to give you a sense, a little more sense of the opportunities there. Um, you wouldn't think about shipping fluid milk to a market like China. Uh, and we've actually tried shipping fresh milk that has a shelf life of about 21 days, and 
We sell it in places like Hong Kong for $10 a quart. The fact that they're willing to pay $10 a quart for fresh milk says something about the opportunity there. The other majority of the milk sold in China is what's called UHT, or ultra-high temperature pasteurized milk. It's shelf-stable. It's sterilized, basically, uh, for, for it to be shelf-stable. If you've ever tasted that kind of milk, it doesn't taste very good. Uh, it has this cooked note to it, and it's thinned down, not very appealing to consumers. But that's the majority of the milk sold in China right now. We've been experimenting in the middle of that range with a product called ESL milk, which is extended shelf life milk, which is pasteurized at a higher temperature than normal traditional fresh milk, but it gives it about an 80 to 90 day shelf life. So it gives us the ability to now ship that to many of these markets in Asia, and we're doing extremely well with that in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, the Philippines, um, where we're selling you know, a, a wonderful amount of milk and it's growing like crazy right now. I'd say we have probably 10x that opportunity in China alone. Uh, the problem is there are plant uh, inspection requirements by, this, by the country of uh, China that make it very difficult right now to get this product in, in part because they don't have a category classification for extended shelf life milk. And so we're trying to work through this with the U.S. De Dairy Export Council um, and trying to find a way that we can get this product approved for, for China because we think there's just tremendous potential there. The other one I, I just want to mention uh, briefly and from an opportunity standpoint is, is cheese. Um, when you look at the highest per capita consumption markets in terms of cheese, Denmark is the highest, France is the one you automatically think about, upwards of 60 pounds per person per year. The U.S. is about 36 pounds per person per year. Then you look at our key export markets, Mexico, Korea, Japan, fractions of that um, you know, ranging from five to eight pounds of cheese per person per year. China is about three ounces per person per year. The upside potential here, needless to say, is extremely high. And the problem, though, is that we can't get processors approved to sell their products in this country. <laughs> So a little more about that process. Um, in China, you have to be on the list. And this list is um, published by the CNCA, which is China's version of our FDA. Uh, they maintain, uh, again, it's a, it's a list of certified plants, dairy plants, um, that are approved for import. It is a highly complex process uh, with different requirements for every single dairy category. I asked one of my people to just give me a, a summary of what that process looks like. They gave me an eight page summary of, of what the process is involved uh, with trying to get plants certified to sell product into China. Uh, it, it, it's just crazy and it's, it's mind numbing. And we have not had a single processor added to this list since 2014 significantly, obviously, limiting our ability to sell product in that market. And the irony is China just reduced their tariff on cheese in last December from 12% to 8%. So we have an added advantage now financially, but we can't get our, our um, processors uh, into the market. The final irony is that uh, China doesn't consider ice cream a dairy product, um, which is a good thing because it doesn't get any of these restrictions. Uh, so as you can tell, it, it's, it's a frustrating situation that we're in. We're working very closely with the U.S. Dairy Export Council um, to try and make this easier, 
Uh, some of the issue is actually our own FDA, which is involved in this process because they have to approve these dairy plants as well. And um, again, uh, I, I wish I could say this would change overnight. We keep getting told it's, you know, the, the, the fixes are imminent, um, but it, nothing has, has loosened the log jam, log jam yet. So at any rate, that is, uh, that's just a, a quick uh, update on, on the California dairy industry um, and our export woes with China. Uh, we continue to be very bullish on the Asian market. Uh, because of the situation in China, we're focused more on Southeast Asia. As you saw, the numbers in Korea look very good. Uh, we're seeing lots of potential in uh, places like Vietnam, the Philippines, um, and, and all around that Southeast Asia area. So um, we continue to be optimistic, but again, unfortunately with China, it's, it's, a, it's a tough row right now. Great. Thank you, John. We'll go ahead and open it up uh, to the board for, for any questions you may have of all three of the gentlemen here. Andy? Yeah, on the Don. last presentation, thank you. That was excellent. I, I just had a question. Uh, so are there other, other countries that have the uh, ESL uh, technology, and who's our big competitors in that? Um, we're, we're, we're just beginning to see uh, Australian and New Zealand uh, entering into the CSL uh, category. Uh, New Zealand, interestingly enough, because they have a free trade agreement with China, this is exempt. Those products are exempt from the CNCA list. Um, so we just have to, again, deal with what we've got. But yes, we are starting to see competition. Thank you for the presentations. Um, I'm curious, do, do citrus and uh, pistachios have similar phytosanitary or access issues that milk has and a number of other commodities from California have? The answer for citrus is yes. So we have those restrictions in place and not just in China, but uh, throughout the world. And the answer for pistachios is no. Uh, however, uh, in the video that I showed, um, many of, or much, if not all, of the product that's brought in from Iran into China is bleached. So their product has a dark staining on the shell, and it's bleached. It's allowed in China. Uh, we've been trying to work with the government to ban it. Um, and when the bleaching is completed, the, the shell looks white and bright, um, but it's an inferior product inside. And, um, you know, to, we try to educate consumers. It's bleached with hydrogen peroxide. Can this be good for you? There's no studies done regarding that. Um, and, and we tr promote and sell our product uh, on the, the natural tan color and the natural basis. But as far as any other restrictions, we don't have any. Does um, ESL have a good taste? Yes. Uh, it actually tastes much closer to fresh milk than to the ultra-high pasteurized temperature milk. Um, uh, we haven't done any official taste tests, but we're actually considering doing that in a couple of these Asian markets. Um, because if you literally, if you were just sit down and just compare them, um, it's it's a far cry, much better than the traditional milk that's sold in many of these places. And again, because a lot of these countries don't have their own adequate domestic production, they rely on these um, shelf-stable milks that come in. Many of them come from Europe, actually. And, and they don't have to worry about, you know, cold storage. They don't have to worry about shipment dates. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to that kind of milk, but the disadvantage is, is a clear taste disadvantage. Thank you. Um, and is ice cream a factor in export? Uh, it is be becoming more and more uh, of, a, of a popular product. Um, and again, the, the limitation has historically been the cold chain. 
there hasn't been adequate cold storage throughout the distribution network in getting it to supermarkets and keeping it cold. That is improving constantly on a, on a day to day basis. Uh, we just did an ice cream event in the Philippines, okay? Four degrees off the equator, and believe me, ice cream is a very popular thing there. Um, but again, now that they have the capability of shipping it and storing it, we're starting to see a, a much greater interest in the product in terms of sales. Maybe they'd like pistachio ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. John? It's, it is kind of a follow-up. Can I just add a quick follow-up? I, I am. Then this is regarding uh, dairy and milk, and I'm, it's extremely fascinating the information you share. I am curious, however, from a cultural standpoint, and it's interesting that you mentioned the Philippines and um, just the ESL and the opportunity. I noticed the word and the potential. Is there really a market for this there? And again, for culturally speaking. Dairy is not typically a high-consuming product. No. In fact, in, in many, particularly in the Asian countries, dairy was not existent 50 years ago. Um, they didn't know what milk was or cheese or, or ice cream. And, and so this is all very new from a cultural standpoint. But as has been said by many of the speakers today, as these markets mature, and they become more westernized in their interests and in their uh, dietary habits and, into the, and in their food interests. They are coming around uh, to a lot of these products. And for dairy, the big precipitate for growth uh, for us has been pizza. No surprise. And the amount of cheese that goes into a lot of these markets on pizza is extraordinary. And what we're finding is that as they like the taste of cheese on pizza, they're starting to look for it in other places and use it on other things. And one of the key success markets for us is Korea. Korea, 50% of their imports are actually cheese. It's the largest in Asia by far, by far. And I asked somebody from Korea, why, why is cheese so popular in, in Korea? Well. He said to me, he said, because Koreans are starting to use cheese on their traditional local cuisine. So you'll get people using mozzarella cheese on their noodle soup. And all of a sudden, again, it just catches on fire. And it goes from one thing to the next. And all of a sudden, people love these, these products. Thank you. I just, I had a uh, Quick pistachio question and then a quick citrus question. On pistachios, 2015 was a, was a really bad year. What what happened there and what are the what are the trends? It seems like chilling hours is one of the problems. And yeah. Where do you see that going? So pistachios, like many other uh, tree fruits, like stone fruit, cherries, peaches, plums, nectarines, require a certain amount of cold weather during the winter time. We, we call it dormant rest. Uh, we require about 800 hours below 45 degrees. So in, in years in which we don't get chill during the winter, in our orchards we have both male and female trees. So unlike, let's say, almonds, where you have the male and female parts within the flower and you have a bee that pollinizes um, that flower into a nut, we have a male tree that produces pollen, the female tree that produces the nuts, and it's receptive to the pollen at, at a particular time of year. And so when the male and female trees don't get enough dormant rest, enough chilling, they push out or grow at different rates. And so when the female trees are ready for the pollen, the pollen is already exhausted off the, the male trees. So low chill hours uh, are an issue. On top of that, in 2015, the 2014 uh, winter, we had low rain, so low water availability. So um, even though we are consider ourselves a drought-tolerant plant, we still require, you know, at least a couple acre feet of water. Uh, and that's all that some orchards got, where three and a half is what's recommended by the University of California in order to produce a normal-sized crop. Are there any uh, tech technology remedies for that timing problem, or you just have to live with it? Um, there's been some experimentation with certain types of dormant oils, 
Uh, some people have experimented with, with applying clay um, like they do on walnuts and cherries, and they do that on pistachios, but they do it during the dormant season to keep the, 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 the limbs cooler. So there's been all types of experimentation going on, including uh, developing new varieties that may not require as much chill. Great, thanks. So quick question on citrus. I didn't get a clear sense of how important the China market was for California citrus. Um, can, can you just give me a sense of, is this, a, is this an important market? It is an important market. It's not our, our, our largest market. And so um, it's, it's down there. I think uh, uh, there's several countries above China as far as who we export. We do use a lot of it uh, domestically as well. And so um, it's, it's not a, a major, major market for us. But if you're shipping product over there, it, it is an important market. So, and the, it's, the, it is, so what's the current tariff, tariff situation? Is it, did you say 15%? Yeah, was that well, we, we had a 11% tariff, and we just got another 15% on it, so it's about 26% cur uh, currently. And that's just in the last, in this last little trade? Right, on on April 2nd. Okay. Rick? Oh, sorry. Richard, I had a quick question for you. When you look at your production coming here in California on pistachios, <clears throat> it, what's happening in Iran as far as their production? Are they decreasing or increasing? And then... I know it's an alternate bearing year. Are they on the same year that we are as far as um, the, the schedule goes? Yeah, uh, to your first question, um, we estimate that Iran is losing about 20,000 hectares or 40,000 acres per year to what we term desertification. So they have some of the same situations that we have on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, little or no water or salty water. Uh, in fact, some of the research that we've seen shows that they're irrigating their trees with water that is as salty as the ocean. And you could just see over a number of years the trees declining and eventually dying. Uh, they are now producing in some other areas, um, and, but they don't have the water supply that they need to be able to, to grow the trees. Um, as to the, the, the question about production, um, yeah, so the alternate bearing with Iran, at one point we were both having our on years and our off years on the same cycle, and because they had, we had our issue in 2015, we went off to a different cycle than, than them, and uh, so now we're, we're uh, alternating, which is good over, overall for worldwide production. Interestingly enough, they have tripled the amount of acres in Iran than we do here in the United States. They have over 600,000 acres, but they're grown as bushes, and so they're hand harvesting these bushes or knocking them onto, the, onto tarps, whereas we grow ours as trees. Some of their new orchards are being uh, transitioned over to a tree with more mechanical harvesting, but um, they're still traditionally growing them as bushes. John, one, la one last question. One last question. We're, we're getting into uh, our short lunch um, period. <laughs> How concerned are you about a prolonged trade war? I mean, are I mean, can can you grow? I mean, you all represent growers. Can they make it a year, two years, three years? I mean, uh, I I don't sense any anxiousness on your part, and. Certainly, the growers that I talk to are very anxious. So I'm I'm curious, um, you know, what you know, how hard you're pushing, or is it kind of we're just working along? Well, I'll start since I probably have the the crop that's least impacted. Um, I know pistachios, uh, China's a heavy market for, it. but we've talked to our growers, and and they um, they're ready and willing. They uh, they understand the difficulties with China and want it corrected. And so they're behind the administration. And, and can we last one, two, three years? I, I think the answer to that is yes, because what they've done so far is we've got a, a citrus crop that's in high demand. And consumers like it, and they want it. They want the safe product, uh, and it's a delicious product. And so uh, as a few shipments have uh, been canceled or, or, or questioned, 
uh, other buyers have been in place to, to move that product in another place. So I, I think for the, obviously we'd like to see a, a resolution, but uh, I think our, our growers are, are willing to wait it out. In our case, we don't see much of an impact today, but the, the question is what is going to happen long term. And I think I would be saying something very different if our chief competitor, Iran, had a very large crop and they were competing for our number one market, China, and they were able to, to sell it 15 percent lower. We were told we have a, many Iranian growers um, within our membership, and we were told that they were dancing in the streets that the tariff had been imposed on our product. Um, so, you know, this is what happens from one competitor to another. You like to see your competitor go down. Um, so, again, we'd be see, saying a di very different story if we had more competition via more production from the country of Iran, but today we don't see it. Just, just a quick note on dairy. Um, it's already happening, uh, to your question, and, and it's not even because of these tariffs. Uh, we've lost 2 billion pounds of milk in the last, well, since 2014. Uh, we've lost about 250 dairies since 2014. Um, the financial pressures of having the lowest milk price in the country, uh, the financial pressures of uh, in environmental restrictions and regulatory activities um, is pushing people out of the business on a daily basis. If we have to endure increased tariffs uh, from China or Again, worst case scenario, something happens to our business in Mexico, that is only going to accelerate. I'd like to thank all of you. We really appreciated having you here today, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you again. So uh, we're going to go ahead and grab lunch. Uh, we're supposed to start up in about 10 minutes, so <laughs> we can have a few extra minutes. So. Uh, speaker is welcome to join us, Josh. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you very much.